Good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, here at uh, CSIS this morning. Uh, we have an audience both in the room as well as uh, uh, on online. That, that program is being live streamed. Uh, my name is Sujay Shivakumar. I'm a senior fellow here at CSIS and the director of our Renewing American Innovation Pro uh, pro Project. Before we begin our, pro our program, I just want to quickly share with you some building safety precautions. Overall, of course, we feel secure in our building, but as a, a convener, we have a duty to prepare for any eventuality. So I will serve as your responsible safety officer in uh, this event. So if there is a, a, a situation that, uh, 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 that requires attention, uh, please follow my instructions. Uh, finally, you know, I think the, the, please familiarize yourself with the emergency exit pathway, which is uh, as you came in. So that is uh, behind you. So uh, CSIS launched the Renewing American Innovation Project two years ago, recognizing that the nation's innovation system itself is a critical shared uh, national resource, and that reinvesting in this resource is essential for our economic well-being as well as for our national security. The Chips and Science Act passed last year with uh, bipartisan support also reflects this view that our nation needs to reinvest in our manufacturing systems, in our research and development systems, and in our workforce systems. The strength of these networks connected across the nation's regions is foundational to our economic vitality, our global competitiveness, and as I said, our national security. So today's workshop also reflects the view that it's critical that we secure the future of the nation's semiconductor industry if the U.S. is to lead in the technologies of the future. As Dr. Hamry, uh, CSIS president, can attest, the, pres the presence of Senator Young and Senator Kelly this morning underlines these imperatives of domestic renewal as well as global leadership. So Dr. Hamry, can I invite you to introduce our guests and to moderate this opening session of this workshop on enhancing the regional impact of chips and science. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. We're delighted to have you here, all of those in the room, as well as all of those that are listening in. This is a, really a very important conversation. Uh, you know, it's uh, one of the most common statements that you hear if you've been in Washington a long time is that we don't do industrial policy. You know, and, and that really traces back to uh, the last year of President Carter's presidency. He was flopping around trying to figure out how to get reelected and announced that he was going to create a great new industrial policy agenda for America. And of course, that became, made it a lightning rod for politics. And since that time, we've you know, we basically say we don't do industrial policy in the United States, but in reality, we do. Um, Abraham Lincoln created the Transcontinental Railroad Program. That was industrial policy. President Eisenhower with the uh, interstate road system. That was industrial policy. Um, in just not too long ago, I had to give up my, all of my televisions that were analog because the government said we had to go digital because we needed the bandwidth, right? I mean, we do industrial policy here, but it's very important to understand what we do is we set the conditions. The government sets the conditions for the private sector to prosper. We don't pick winners and losers, but we do want to win. And that means creating the right framework for uh, America's success, economic success in the world. And these two gentlemen uh, have been pioneers in doing this. So I'll be very brief. I'll introduce them both, and each of them will have remarks, and then we'll have a little bit of a conversation. Um, Senator Todd Young, um, you were one of the original sponsors of the Endless Frontiers Act, and that was really the precursor that grew into the CHIPS Act. Uh, and it was pioneering work, and it was bipartisan. You and I think Senator Schumer were leading the way on that very early on, saying we needed this. Now it's typical. He's uh, dedicated his whole life to the United States, commissioned as a, as a Marine Corps intelligence officer, I believe, and, uh, and then has served in public life in the, in the Congress, you know, in the Senate since 2016, in the House before that. And so he understands the importance of thoughtful, wise leadership, you know, f for America. And that America, the government does play an important role in all of this. 
Senator, um, Senator Mark Kelly is, uh, a, rose to be a, a captain in the Navy, uh, flew 39 combat missions uh, as a Navy aviator, uh, over 5,000 hours, I think, you had in various cockpits, and was a, was a, was a uh, flight trainer, and then ultimately became an astronaut. And um, my wife, she's so happy I'm here to meet a real astronaut this morning, so she, she told me to really put that up high in the, on the roster. <clears throat> but then he's been a champion for the intellectual foundation of American competitiveness. And it's for that reason that we have these two gentlemen with us today. I think, Senator Young, you're going to lead the way, so let me ask you to come up. Please welcome Senator Todd Young to the stage. Well, thank you, John, for that generous introduction. It's, it's great to be with people, actually in person, in, in the wake of in an, another industrial policy, John, by the name of uh, Operation Warp Speed. Um, I want to thank CSIS and the Indiana University uh, Public Policy Institute for holding this event today on enhancing the regional impact of the Chips and Science Act. And I can't think of a colleague who I'd rather uh, be in attendance uh, with today than, uh, more than uh, Senator Kelly. Uh, he is uh, he's a great American, and uh, he worked very hard to help us get this bill across the line, include some important tax incentives uh, so that we could sure, ensure the Chips and Science Act was successful not just uh, through the halls of Congress, but in implementation as well. This event, of course, does have an Indiana University connection uh, so I'd like to acknowledge that uh, many of us here today are from what many disparagingly call flyover country. We embrace the term. We lean into it back in the Hoosier State. It's a, it's a term that brings pride. Regardless of why some folks may use this term, the reality is that millions of Americans live in places other than our major metropolitan areas. They live in places far away from the coasts. And yet, just five cities, Boston, San Diego, San Francisco, San Jose, and Seattle, experienced more than 90% of the job growth in advanced sectors like tech, computer manufacturing, biotech, and telecom between 2005 and 2017. More than 90% of the job growth in those sectors. In 2019, there were only three coastal states, California, Massachusetts, and New York, which were home to more than 75% of all venture-backed investments in the United States. Three out of every four venture dollars go into those three states in 2019. As one example, California made up $1,600 in venture-backed investment per resident per year. I'm happy for California, that's great for our country, but Indiana averaged $57 per resident per year. Since 2000, 94% of the nation's job growth has been in urban areas. Just 31 counties out of more than 3,000, 31 out of 3,000 nationwide account for a third of the nation's gross domestic product. Now, I understand the drivers. I've spent quite a bit of time trying to understand uh, the economics behind all of this. But from a, a social and a civic standpoint, having a, a country where most of the new opportunities are opening up in, in just a few coastal urban places can divide us. It can put us at a disadvantage uh, in our global comp competition with other countries, China in particular as well. Too much of the innovation America needs is coming from too few of our citizens in too few of the great places across our country. In short, if our people must constitute a new arsenal of democracy, our stockpiles are too thinly spread. And the playing field is not level. With its capitalist communist economic system, the Chinese Communist Party is heavily subsidizing its own tech industry. CCP has invested $14 trillion 
in frontier technologies that will shape our modern economy and, and decide winners of future wars, technologies like quantum computing, robotics, and artificial intelligence. They've also made advances in hypersonic missile technology, which could allow nuclear projectiles to travel at five times the speed of sound while avoiding our current defense systems. China accounted for less than 4% of microchip production half a decade ago, but it's now on pace to control roughly 20% of the market by 2024. And if China produces more and more of our world supply of semiconductors, America's economy and security could be at the mercy of the CCP, especially in the event of another pandemic or, God forbid, a war. After all, 90% of the chips in our military hardware are currently made overseas. Last year, when a bipartisan coalition in Congress passed the Chips and Science Act, America went on the offense against the Chinese Communist Party. And the CCP knows it. In fact, they actively lobbied against the law. They knew it was bad for China. They knew it was good for the United States. That's because the Chips and Science Act gives our people the tools to flourish and ensures America continues its global leadership role. It's both a national security investment and an investment in our peoples and communities. A major portion of the law's funding goes toward ensuring that more Americans have the requisite skills to work in these industries of the future. One area, of course, is semiconductors, but it also includes uh, funding for areas like hypersonic systems, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. The Chips and Science Act will help connect more of our citizens to, broadly speaking, this innovation economy, not just in the semiconductor field. And as most of you know, the law is already jump-starting semiconductor production here in the United States, including in the industrial Midwest, in so-called flyover country. Looking at Indiana, for example, development of a corridor of the semiconductor industry is already underway. Since the Chips and Science Act was enacted, semiconductor companies have announced manufacturing, design, and R&D expansions across the United States, including many in Indiana. An emerging domestic microchip industry will provide jobs and it will prevent future supply chain stop stoppages and safeguard our military readiness. And it will, I believe, help bridge the economic opportunity gap that divides our citizens. I, I also want to mention that we are nearing the announcement by the Economic Development Administration of a funding opportunity for phase one of the Regional Technology and Innovation Hubs Contest. As you may know, there are two funding opportunities. The first phase, phase one, will designate at least 20 tech hubs and award strategy development grants. The tech hubs designated in phase one can then participate in the next phase where the remaining money designated for the program will assist five hubs with implementation with hopefully more funding from Congress to come for tech hubs in the near future. Because of this contest, all over Indiana, we've seen a pooling of resources and collaboration on strategy uh, across both public and private sectors and ac ac uh, academia as, as regions position themselves to win a tech hub designation. Given that, I remain cautiously optimistic about Indiana's prospects for landing a tech hub. Regardless of the outcome, I've been encouraged. Interest at the state and local level in the program has been tremendous. One of the reasons I'm so excited about that is it, it, it's fostered local collaborations. This collaboration creates a national ecosystem where regions compete, not where the federal government arbitrarily picks winners and losers. The law is a catalyst for coordination, collaborations, and new partnerships that will be productive for years to come. A few examples from our home state. Of course, Indiana universities innovate Indiana. Purdue universities work with the Greater Lafayette Commerce to win $5 million 
to support Skywater Semiconductor Manufacturing Facility in the Discovery Park District at Purdue. Rose Holman Institute of Technologies, Rose Holman Ventures. Rose Holman, by the way, has also partnered with the University of Illinois and Stanford to establish new semiconductor curricula for its students. And Franklin Colleges recently uh, opened $200 million Center for Tech Innovation, a space for collaboration between students, faculty, and industry. On top of this, Indiana's General Assembly recently passed an ambitious budget that includes over a billion dollars for economic development efforts. This included $500 million to spur greater regional economic partnerships. I've been in regular communication with the governor, the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, our Department of Commerce, and state legislative leaders. I'm encouraging continued implementation on strategies to attract private investment while also pursuing federal opportunities, including those in the Chips and Science Act. This is exactly the strategy we need to connect more people in regions to the high-tech economy. One other thing I'm stressing as implementation of the law moves forward is a focus on place, on physical hubs. It's important that we upskill our workforce, but it's also important that this law leaves a physical legacy in communities. In addition to the economic benefits of skills training, there's tremendous value in the proximity of innovators in creating growth centers, ecosystems where startups and incubators, academia and industry all cluster and coexist. Now, there's still a great deal of work to do. Still, I'm incredibly optimistic about the opportunity before us. Because of this law, we have a once-in-a-generation chance to harness our greatest assets, our people, especially those in overlooked places, to win the future and to secure another American century. We can become more prosperous. We can position more regions to grow economically, to attract and retain talent and to leave a legacy to our kids and grandkids. And they will be able to say with pride that when the innovation that determines global contests and brings wide prosperity emerges, it will not be from a few select regions that have benefited from the weight of government investment in generations prior, but instead it will be from all of America. Thank you. So much for having me, and I'll, I'll look forward to visiting with my colleague in a moment. All right, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Dr. Hambry, thank you. Uh, Administrator Castillo, great to see you again. Thank you for all your trips across uh, the country. We were just speaking um, about uh, the administrator has visited 40 states, including trips to, I think, Indiana, Arizona, uh, all in furtherance of um, industrial policy. Um, first, I want to thank Senator Young for all of his hard work and leadership that went uh, making the Chips and Science Act such a success. And I don't think it's uh, an exaggeration to say that without Senator Young's initial willingness to work collaboratively on what we then called the Endless Frontiers Act, we would have never been able to build this bipartisan law that we're here to talk about today. And I have to say that endless may have been a good word to describe the process. I mean, it took nearly two years, and I think we, how many, four years? Uh, and we ended up renaming the bill about a half a dozen times. And the process ran into a bunch of roadblocks, um, and it took a lot of hard work to get this done. But the benefits of this bipartisan law really cannot be overstated. You know, microchips are in everything that has an on-off switch from your coffee maker to your cell phone to the most advanced fighter jets and weapon systems and spacecraft. 
and we invented the microchip here in the United States. But we don't make enough of them domestically. At least we don't anymore. In fact, the share of microchips that are manufactured in the United States today is just 12 percent. It used to be 40 percent. In 1990, it was 40 percent. And this is a problem. And we really saw the downside of this during COVID-19. During the pandemic, when lockdowns strained supply chains, we couldn't get enough microchips here in the United States. And we couldn't produce the things we need to make. And it drove up the cost of everything from new cars and then even used cars to how much it would cost to produce the military equipment and technology that our service members rely on to keep us safe. And our reliance on supply chains across the oceans, I mean, this was a real threat to our national security and to our economy. So right after I was sworn into the United States Senate, I got to work on this for months. I worked with Senators Young, Cornyn, Senator Warner, and others to negotiate a deal to fund the CHIPS Act programs. And that's what we did. We developed this $52 billion plan, a bipartisan plan to support the construction of the most advanced semiconductor manufacturing facilities right here in the United States. And we provided the dedicated funding for research and development programs as well to make sure that the next generation of microchips were discovered. And this is an important part of this. Discovered, meaning invented, designed, tested, and then built here in the United States. And through the course of negotiating the Chips and Science Act, you know, I pushed for us to go a little bit further on this, making sure that our incentive grants were both for the actual semiconductor manufacturing, but also for the tool and equipment manufacturers. Those are often left out. Because in order to bring this manufacturing back to our country, we need to boost the entire ecosystem that goes into creating microchips, not just the manufacturing of the chip itself. So we created new investment tax credits to supercharge semiconductor investment here in the United States. And now we are starting to see the effects of these investments. Just a few weeks ago, when I was back in Arizona, I toured the uh, Intel's, their new manufacturing facility, the building that they're, they're putting up, the fab. Um, and their two new factories are going to create about 3,000 construction jobs and then 3,000 manufacturing jobs, high-paying jobs that you can actually raise a family on. And not to mention the thousands of other jobs, the multiplier on a high-end semiconductor manufacturing job is on the order of maybe seven to ten additional jobs in the community to support those workers. Now these factories, the two Intel factories, they're expected to be fully operational next year. Chips coming off the production line. And then on the other side of Phoenix, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company is building their first manufacturing facility here in the United States. And thanks to the CHIPS Act passage, their investment in our country has now gone from $12 billion to $40 billion. It is perhaps one of the biggest foreign investments in manufacturing in the history of the United States. And that $40 billion number, that is likely to increase beyond that. And that facility is going to produce some of the most advanced semiconductors ever made in our country, including the chips that go in your iPhone or the chips that are used to drive artificial intelligence platforms and autonomous vehicles. So you might be asking why Arizona? Like, how did this happen? Well, the foundation for this success, I mean, this isn't just with the CHIPS Act. This goes back decades. Companies like Motorola and Intel came to Arizona in the 1960s and 70s when we were sending astronauts to the moon for the first time, you know, powered by computer chips and computing power that is much less powerful than what is on a smartwatch today. 
But that laid the foundation for the modern Arizona economy, and the industrial base cultivated a talented workforce. And this was bolstered by some world-class research institutions and some really good community colleges. And today, that ecosystem supports defense companies like Raytheon. Raytheon Missile Systems is near where Gabby and I live in Tucson. Um, Boeing manufactures the Apache helicopter in Arizona. Northrop Grumman, I just visited Honeywell, which makes some jet engines and, I mean, just aerospace technology for across the sector. And then we also have these future industries like First Solar, Core Power, Lucid, who makes electric vehicles in Casa Grande. And it's why we're becoming a hub for semiconductor manufacturing. I mean, we're well positioned to take advantage of these investments that are going to be transformative for our economy, not only in Arizona, but nationwide. And these investments are going to create tens of thousands of good paying jobs that do not require a four year degree. Now, last year, while I was working on the chips law, I met with two women uh, over a Zoom call. One of them, um, she told me her story, which I thought was pretty incredible. I mean, this woman was out of work for over a year. She had three kids. She was a single mom. She could not find a job. And she's looking through her email, her spam folder. Who goes in their spam folder? I don't ever go in there. She goes in her spam folder, and she sees this ad for this uh, thing called the Quick Start Program at Estrella Mountain Community College. It is a 10-day program to give her a background in semiconductor manufacturing, and it promised that at the end of the 10 days, if you complete this, you would get an interview with a semiconductor manufacturing company. So she figured, what the heck, and she called, and she got somebody on the phone, and she got into the program, she completed it. She got an interview with Intel, and now she works at Intel as a semiconductor manufacturing technician. I mean, it is a story that we will see repeated over and over again because of the chips loss. But in order to maximize these investments and see them multiply in years to come, we need to invest not just in individual companies, but in the long-term competitiveness of regions. And that's why the long-term programs included in the CHIPS Act, like the establishment of the National Semiconductor Technology Center or the Microelectronics Commons or the Regional Technology Hub that Senator Young talked about, these programs will help regions like Arizona, like Indiana. It'll help us build the infrastructure to sustain the growth that we're seeing right now. And some of this is physical infrastructure. Like, like an example, you know, we need to widen this highway that goes entirely across the country, I-10, that through a good part of Arizona goes down to two lanes and every single day gets backed up for hours. It's a public safety issue. But it's also an issue for companies that are trying to locate their facilities near that transportation network. But it's also about human capital infrastructure. In Arizona, we have programs at Arizona State University and our community colleges that benefit from these regional investment programs. We need to be able to scale up their capacity to train the future engineers and technicians to do these jobs. And we have a long way to go, a long way to go until we fully realize the opportunities provided by the CHIPS Act. But I'm confident thanks to the leadership we've seen uh, from the Assistant Secretary at EDA to Secretary Raimondo and others in the administration, and through our continued bipartisan collaboration in Congress, we can ensure that the Chips and Science Act is the catalyst that will jumpstart a new generation of American innovation. So, we will continue, if we get this right, and we do this right, we will continue to lead in the world in researching, developing, and manufacturing the technologies of the future. And thank you again, Dr. Hambry, thank you for having me, and uh, look forward to our Q&A. Thank you.
Thank you both. Um, really, really great speeches. And uh, it, it shows what leadership, what it means <coughs> leadership makes. Uh, you've both been leaders, and we're grateful for that. Um, let me start by just asking, you know, the CHIPS Act did appropriate funds for semiconductors, but there were an awful lot of other initiatives in the, in the CHIPS Act that were really authorizations. They weren't appropriations. Um, you know, I was used to be an authorizer, and I remember an appropriator once saying, well, you give them hunting license, I give them rabbits, okay? How are we going to get funding for the rest of the CHIPS Act? Well, it has to be a priority. Um, bottom line, and, and uh, we of course need uh, our in-state stakeholders, and that should be everyone, but some are closer to this effort than others. So uh, those who work in our un research universities, those who, who will have a direct role in training this and next generation and, and hopefully beyond uh, in, in the technologies of the future, uh, your legislators need to hear from you. Uh, uh, and uh, be reminded of the value proposition of making these critical investments. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we need to uh, be making the case uh, about uh, the, 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 the spillover benefits, and there are many that will be realized, the products and services, uh, which uh, we have the disadvantage of, of not being able to predict exactly what they are, but we can look backward and uh, learn from recent history uh, we've made critical investments uh, in our space program, in our aerospace program. That, of course, led to uh, breakthroughs in these fields. The intellectual property was used by private investors to scale up uh, whatever, uh, whatever findings we had. Uh, we will need to hear from uh, or associations, those in this in town and, and well beyond. Uh, the National Association of Manufacturers, for example. We are the most manufacturing intensive state in the country. One argument I'm making is, uh, look, we make synthetic biology uh, investments uh, in, in research through the Chips and Science Act. Uh, we will be increasingly drawing on that field and many others to determine the sort of things we're making in the state of Indiana. And if we are to continue to move up the value added uh, uh, chain to ensure that our workers can, can uh, earn better wages, even in what some call flyover country, uh, it, it's going to be essential that the United States uh, has first dibs, as it were, uh, to, those, to those findings. So um, it, it just, it's going to take leadership, and uh, it will take collaboration across party lines. It's no secret that we have a, a Democratic president, a, a Democrat-controlled Senate, and a Republican-controlled House. So by definition, we have to play well with and, and work with one another if we want to uh, accomplish anything of significance. I, I guess the last thing is, in implementation of the CHIPS and Science Act, we need to take every measure, and I believe the administration is working with you know, uh, legislators and our partners uh, throughout the country on the ground, as well as our, our, our uh, allies around the world, to ensure that implementation is done with fidelity, consistent with legislative intent, and uh, with economy, spending every dollar uh, that's allocated in the most efficient, effective way possible. And uh, there are no doubt, John, uh, some uh, pockets of individuals who are wedded to uh, a notion that uh, industrial policy uh, is, uh, is always wrong, irrespective of, of what the lessons of history uh, show and the many benefits we've gotten from that. So we'll have to be prepared to win these arguments. And, and I think we, we will. Uh, but uh, I know Mark's committed to this effort. Arizona State's going to benefit, but more importantly, he's a patriot. He knows our country will benefit, and, and uh, a lot of Republicans and Democrats are, are committed to allocating sufficient resources to make this successful. It's interesting, Senator Young, uh, Todd commented about how some feel industrial policy is, is um, you know, not something we should be doing. That also is bipartisan, by the way. You know, I've seen, yeah. <laughs> I remember, you know, just being down in, um, you know, some all Senate briefings and have folks from, you know, just on both sides of the aisle not wanting to do this. Mm -hmm. And it was not easy to convince um, both the Republicans and the Democrats as caucuses that this is the right thing to do. Uh, because there are some folks that are often, you know, for, for different reasons, you know, are against taking 
bold, dramatic steps, but as uh, Senator Young says, you know, history has showed that this is just, it's good for our country. You're both defining what Americans desperately want in leadership in Congress, and thank you. Really grateful for that. This, uh, our partner today, of course, is uh, Indiana University powerhouse. And, um, you mentioned, Senator Young, um, the role that venture capital plays, but it's too narrowly focused. Yes. It's just in the hot spots, you know. There's a partner to venture capital, which is tech transfer out of universities. You know, the um, universities are these great engines of ideas, yes. but uh, it's very hard to get ideas from a scientist who doesn't know business into commercialization. So we have technology transfer offices in your universities. They become crucial partners, but they're kind of under, uh, under, people don't appreciate what they do. Can you just share with us how you work with the universities to kind of get them, encourage them to be more innovative and to create real jobs? They can be an engine for us. Yeah, I, um, before this job, uh, a while back, I was on the board of the engineering school at, uh, at the University of Arizona. And when I joined, they didn't have much of a technology transfer program at all. Uh, but NASA did. And I saw the benefit of NASA's technology transfer program that would take um, innovation and invention uh, from NASA employees, you know, patent it, and you know, then work with industry um, to move these technologies to the private sector. Some universities do a fantastic job at this. I mean, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT as an example, generates an enormous amount of revenue yeah. that they can then reinvest into the university, into more innovation, um, into, the, into labs that create this technology, and then transfer the next thing mm -hmm. out to the private sector. Um, but I worked with U of A to encourage them that they've got to get better on, yeah. at this. And, connected them, you know, with, uh, with NASA as well. And today, I mean, this is now 15 years later, they have a, you know, a technology program and it has helped Tucson, you know, start to grow a small, like right now, a small ecosystem of, of, of tech companies that are, that, that are starting to develop there from stuff that's been created in the uni university. But, you know, every university doesn't do this. Right. It needs to be something they're focused on. It's really something you may want to consider as you augment this policy. We need to get these engines more productive, but they need help in these tech yes. transfer yeah. offices. Well, there's a notion that universities are, are sort of the locuses for discovery. In a, in a sense, that is, that's absolutely accurate. Our, our, our best minds uh, are often located within the university environment and, and uh, experts in their discipline and, and uh, focused on, on uh, pushing the frontiers of, of uh, science uh, and technology. But uh, that's, that's an incomplete vision. Uh, without the benefit of, of, of the crowd, as it were, as, as the masses yeah, yeah. of people to suggest, to inquire, uh, and, and to hypothesize about how their findings might actually be used in the world, I think you're, you're missing a big part of, of the mission of the university. And yeah. Indiana University gets it. And frankly, this sort of culture, this broader understanding of, of uh, the mission of the university to educate uh, uh, typically the young, but also uh, we're finding uh, those who are, are currently working uh, to make these fundamental discoveries, but also to apply it, that has to be emphasized uh, by the leadership. So President Witten is, is really uh, taking uh, the reins here, and, and uh, she's making this a priority. And uh, it also sustains the support for a university when you have a sense yeah. that these investments uh, really benefit rank and file. Well, it draws stronger faculty. Faculty want to go there when That's there's right. a strong tech That's right. transfer yeah. program. Can I just add, you know, it was Senator from Indiana, Birch Bay, and Bob Dole, uh, 40 years ago, created right. a, what's called Bay Dole, which is a legal framework where we get ideas started with government funding in universities, <laughs> and we get them commercialized. 
Now there is a challenge to that. It's coming from people that want to drive down the price of pharmaceutical drugs and the so-called march-in rights. It, there's just a fundamental question that's really on the table, which is, you know, who owns intellectual property that was funded by the federal government? And the Bayh-Dole Act really created a very fair, sensible balance. Yes. It said, you know, the government has some rights, but we want you to bring it to the market. But there's now a challenge to that, Senator. Can you speak to this? If, I know you're familiar with this challenge on marching rights on Bayh-Dole. Yes, I, well, um, at, at the highest of levels, it's, it's not something I've spent a lot of time yeah, with, yeah. but I, I, I uh, recently learned of, of sort of this, this challenge, and um, I think it's confined mostly to the sort of life sciences, pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical primarily, yeah, area. Because that's the political agenda, yeah. Yes, um, uh, but uh, we're certainly going to, we're going to have to look at Bayh-Dole and make sure that, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a piece of legislation that uh, I think almost universally is recognized as is, uh, catalyzing yeah. un universities to conduct cutting edge uh, research. We want, want to make sure it's, it's, if we need to update it, uh, if we need to take some measures yeah. to, yeah. It, it, you know, it's, it's been such a foundation yeah. for the way we've had idea innovation in yes. America these last 40 years, but it's now being threatened, and I think it's just something we should be looking at. Do we understand mm -hmm. what's at risk here? Let me, if I could, just, you know, uh, ask, this is a somewhat different uh, question. Um, you know, 90% of all the people that filed for patents, um, you know, in 2020 were white guys. Okay, yeah. very few minorities, very few women. You know, the system is really, for some reason, we just are not getting diversity inside the, all the talent pool that we have in this, in this country isn't really manifesting itself when it gets to the world of, of ideas. Part of that is how do we get innovation incentives into HBCUs? for example, and historically black colleges, universities. How do we get a wider spectrum of uh, encouragement in society so it's just not a narrowly focused thing and it isn't just, as you say, in the hot spots. Do, what are your thoughts about this? Well, I, I, I didn't know it was you know, 90% yeah. uh, because uh, I don't believe the workforce of scientists and engineers is 90% right. you know, white male. Um, you know, I think it's uh, a matter of, at a young age, encouraging, uh, and this usually is necessary around middle school, encouraging young people, mm -hmm. uh, people of color, mm -hmm. to continue to be interested in science and math, and, and that's, that's hard, uh, especially with young women. Yeah. Uh, at a certain age, uh, you know, young women become less interested in, in math and science, and it's, it's something that's been going on for decades. Sadly, yeah. Yeah, so I, in, my, in my former job as an astronaut, we spent a lot of time going to schools, you know, elementary, middle schools, high schools, uh, to encourage and get young people excited uh, about, you know, science and math and engineering. Um, it has some effect. It's certainly something that should be scalable. And I think it's really on, you know, all of us. It's, you know, for the folks that are successful, you know, in these, in, in these careers to, to, to give back in some way to encourage, you know, young people to do this. And it's not just, you know, it's, it's, it's not just in this area either. I mean, it's, uh, we've got, you know, issues with, you know, military recruiting right now. Yeah. Um, and it's important at a, a young age to get folks expose them to different opportunities. Yeah. If I could, and I, I know we have to let you out of here, but we've got about five more minutes. Um, if, if I could, could ask, what is, what is the prospect for um, providing support for these tech transfer offices? You know, a, a lot of it, because it isn't just you know, what's out there, and it's, they have to develop an ecosystem within these tech transfer offices with venture capital firms so that they can help direct these. And I think that's going to take some infrastructure support. I mean, there was a part of the uh, CHIPS Act which did not make it was to provide some financial support for universities to strengthen their technology transfer programs. Is that a possibility we could look at in the future? 
Um, it is, um, and, and you know, uh, fiscally um, sometimes austere, always responsible. Uh, states like Indiana <laughs> are going to have to rethink some of the investments they make or don't make. Uh, I can make a very strong argument and, and probably will be making this argument moving forward that, listen, we, uh, we need to make some critical investments in our people and our places. Uh, this is one area where, um, to the extent that um, Indiana uh, picks this lock, as it were, and really figures out how to optimize some of these uh, well-resourced tech transfer offices, it's going to disproportionately benefit our state because your venture capitalists will descend uh, on the university, you know, the, the, uh, to, to visit with researchers, to identify findings that will have some commercial use, to start companies, to uh, identify talent uh, that can work at these companies, on and on. And, and mm -hmm. then the flywheel uh, effect begins. So, uh, I, I, as you indicated, I'm, I'm uh, certainly open to making these investments from the federal level, but I'm a realist. We've, we've asked a lot of my colleagues uh, to, to step yeah, up and yeah, make these yeah. critical investments. Some of them will have to occur at the state, local, regional, uh, what have you level. I'd say one, one additional point I can't resist on the, on the previous question. You know, this is, this is an issue of, of national security, which is how I've sort of addressed this whole notion of industrial policy. For me, it's an exception to the rule. I don't think we should gratuitously get in the business of industrial policies, but we have to, we have to be able to uh, use discernment and judgment to figure out when those exceptions exist, and we've done so um, in, in, in this case, and we must continue uh, to do so and, and not uh, in the slightest, be in the slightest bit uh, embarrassed uh, <laughs> about making exceptions to doctrine. Uh, I, I think instead those who are uh, mindlessly wedded to doctrine uh, ought to be explaining yep. Yep. Uh, themselves. And uh, we need to make uh, critical workforce investments in, in minorities and, and, and women. Uh, <clears throat> that starts with K through 12 systems, yep. which isn't yep. yep. in the main a, a federal issue. Uh, but if we, if we crack that nut, um, I'm not suggesting that all the uh, other challenges will be solved. You need mentoring, it needs to be a priority, on and on. Uh, but uh, I, I do think uh, you'll see a lot more yeah. people choosing STEM as a field if they have inadequate sure preparation to succeed in those areas. You know, just a footnote, you know, when, when we had the, the giant tobacco settlement, you yes. know, and the states got money, Michigan earmarked that money to create venture capital firm and, and tech transfer hubs. Mm -hmm. And it really made a difference. It's really energized it. So I think from the bottom up, there yes. are opportunities if we can find them. And, and John, I don't think it's, huh. it's not one of these things that's incredibly expensive. I mean, for No, a, no. I mean, it, 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 it's rather, I mean, it's, it's small dollars. It also requires that you have a university president that makes it a priority. Yep. Yep. I've seen this at ASU as an example. Michael well, Crow, yeah, you know, Michael Crow has really made this a priority yeah. for the university. And if you just yeah. connect people, you connect the researchers with yeah. private equity, they see the value in some technology, they're willing to invest their own money uh, to get this into, yeah. into the private sector. And then if you have you know, a policy where the, the innovator, the inventor gets to own some of the intellectual property or at least benefit from it, right. you know, you encourage you know, the, 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 the research, yep. and, you know, that often takes a, a lot of time and effort. You're encouraging scientists and engineers to, to continue yep. this, this kind of work. Well, Abraham Lincoln had four planks in his platform when he ran for president, and the one of the first one was public education, and it led to the land grant system. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the great innovations, industrial policy in right. a sense, because it created a foundation. You guys are doing that now in this modern era, and I want, let me just say if any final words, because we're at the hour where I need to let you go. You've got, you've got work to do. Senator Young, first with you. Anything final that you'd like to offer? Uh, implementation is going well on the Chips and Science Act. If we get this right, if we get this right, uh, you will find places and spaces across the country, and Indiana is among them, uh, where uh, we will have the opportunity to make things that are very valuable to mankind, to our people in particular, uh, but, but also leading to uh, uh, handsomely 
compensated jobs uh, for this generation and, and, and beyond, we have an opportunity to be providers of hardware in uh, various technology spaces. We will continue, I predict, to see uh, the coast uh, and conurbations uh, be areas where you see a lot of development of software. Uh, but uh, we have the opportunity to play our cards right to remain a manufacturing intensive part of, of the country and the state of Indiana to make valuable things and, uh, and uh, be a place that is a destination to work as, as, as opposed to um, inheriting one's home mm -hmm. state and, and uh, choosing to stay or leave. Yeah. So uh, I'm really excited about the possibilities. Uh, this took a lot of partnership to uh, get here. Uh, uh, as I've indicated, Senator Kelly played a really important role, and thanks so much for having the two of us yeah. here today. Uh, well, this is about national security. It's about bringing yes. down costs. It's about good paying jobs. And we've got other national security issues we're facing you know, right now. I think one of the reasons why this could have was such a strong bipartisan effort was because of that. Yeah. Um, there's a House Select Committee right now in China uh, that's addressing some other national security issues focused on, you know, our, our biggest adversary. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I think they can be successfully addressed. They, you know, often have to do with supply chains, but other yep. technology that we want to make sure stays here that doesn't get transferred to China. And I think we've got an opportunity to, to get this done. Well, it's leadership like this that makes a difference. I think we are on the cusp of a brilliant new decade because of the investments that are coming this way, and you were leaders to bring us there. Thank, Thank you. you. Would you all please you, congratulate our members? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Okay, so we're ready to start our next panel. Uh, this panel is entitled Integrating Approaches to Regional Innovation. The CHIPS and Science Act authorized bold new initiatives to stimulate innovative activities in America's regions. EDA's Regional Technology and Innovation Hub Program, for example, NSF's Technology and Innovation Partnerships Directorate, and the Department of Defense's Microelectronics Commons programs represent new and integrated approaches to stimulate innovation in several high-tech industries that are critical to our national and economic security. Through various authorities and funding approaches, each is promoting the creation and use of regional collaboratives across sectors to build a network ecosystem of public, private, and academic partners that will accelerate commercialization of chips and related technologies, as well as stimulate research, development, and commercialization of other important technologies and industries. Each of our speakers will provide their perspectives on what I term the emergence and development of regional technology and innovation commons. Our first speaker today is the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Economic Development. Alejandro Castillo is the current Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Economic Development, and in this role, she leads the U.S. Economic Development Administration and is responsible for fulfilling the Bureau's mission of leading the federal economic development agenda. Previously, in 2014, Alejandra was appointed by President Obama to serve as National Director of the Commerce Department's Minority Business Development Agency, becoming the first Hispanic woman to lead the agency. Immediately prior to President, Ob or President Biden appointing her to lead EDA, Castillo was Chief Executive Officer of YWCA USA, where she championed the 163-year-old organization and its 204 associations, serving over 2.3 million women and families across 1,300 communities in the United States. So I'd like to invite Assistant Secretary Castillo to come up and uh, provide us with some opening remarks. Good morning. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Tom. Um, not only are you uh, an incredible um, professional, but also I consider you a dear friend as well, and for the great work that you did at EDA. So I know that EDA is, uh, is deep in your heart. Um, I want to thank CSIS for, for convening us, for having this conversation. Not only is it timely, but it is truly a moment in time to be uh, the futurists, so to speak, of our country. To be able to wear a hat that seldomly we're able to wear because we're trying to solve the problems of yesterday, of, of yesterday without having the opportunity, the bandwidth, the leeway, the funding to think long term. Um, allow me to also take a moment of privilege to thank Phil Singerman, who is in the audience as well. And thank you, Phil. Phil served also as Assistant Secretary of EDA and is someone who uh, knows EDA very well. So we have incredible champions for the Economic Development Administration, but I always start these conversations by giving context because EDA is part of the Department of Commerce, right? And Commerce has 13 different agencies. And I say that because all of those 13 different agencies really work together to create these ecosystems. So think about not only the Census Bureau with the data that they have, think about National Institute of Standards and Technology. And we have our colleague here from NIST who is definitely leading this uh, important moment in time with regards to Chips and Science Act. But also think about NTIA, National Telecommunication and Information Agency, $48 billion to invest in broadband. Uh, think about NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and how we are not only thinking about climate change, but the data that NOAA produces to make sure that our citizens and, and our populations are safe when it comes to hurricanes and tornadoes and, and so much that's happening. Um, think about the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, making sure that we are not only creating the technology and, and innovation, but that we're also producing patents, that we're protecting our intellectual property, and many others that I can go on and on. But I say that because I want you to also, uh, let's also 
recommit ourselves to what Senator Young said. This is about people, places, and possibilities. People, places, and possibilities. And while, yes, the CHIPS, the CHIPS component of the CHIPS and Science Act is tremendously important, both of the senators that you heard pr previously mentioned something very important, which is not only do we need to focus on that particular industry, but we need to also focus on the ecosystem that builds, as President Biden says, from the bottom up, middle out. And I have to say, and I think I've, you may have heard me say this before, you know, this is remarkable to be able to have four pieces of legislation that President Biden has um, signed into law that all kind of focus very intentionally on taking our country to the next level of technology innovation. You have the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. You have the Chips and Science Act. You have the Inflation Reduction Act. And, um, and when we think about all of these different um, initiatives, we also have to think about what the American Rescue Plan uh, did as well. So four pieces of legislation all truly focused on how do we help people, communities, uh, not just rebuild from the pandemic, but leapfrog in so many ways. Um, as you probably heard from Senator Kelly, I live out of a suitcase in so many ways because this job, as Phil reminds me, is about getting out there, being able to see and witness what is happening across the country. And yes, there is this use of this derogatory term of flyover states, but when you go to places like Indiana, like Kentucky, like uh, Iowa, Illinois, Ohio, so many places, you see the assets that are on the ground. And I know that we're gonna take a minute to talk about tech hubs, or more than a minute. I know everyone is very, very focused on tech hubs, but before I talk about tech hubs, I also want to remind you that we also have a second program that EDA is developing, that's called Recompete. We have Tech Hub on one side and Recompete on the other, and both are essential to make sure that we can jumpstart what's happening across America. Recompete will focus on uh, locations that are highly distressed with prime age employment gaps and really bringing in uh, that, those funds, but also what we have learned and how we are now doing economic development grants is that we now can appreciate the value of bringing partnerships and coalitions. So Recompete will follow that model and so will Tech Hubs. The legislation, if you, if you see the legislation, if you read the legislation, and I encourage you to read it, it's 10 pages uh, long, but it, it is the cliff notes of what Tech Hubs is. And it requires the, the creation of consortia, requires the engagement and involvement of universities and community colleges and uh, nonprofit organization and philanthropy and private sector. It requires all of these entities and stakeholders to come to the table and really think about what are the assets on the ground, where are the industries that they believe, that the community believes they are best suited to, to um, uh, pursue. And that model is, is, has shown or has proven to be very successful. And the reason I say that is because, as many of you may know, just last year we issued uh, $3 billion in, in different types of grants on, under the American Rescue Plan. And one of those grants was the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. And I am uh, personally calling um, on, a, on a, a regular basis all of our 21 winners. And what we have noticed is, yes, there were those 21s that were successful, but there were others that may not have been successful in terms of getting the dollars, but were successful in taking those partnerships to the next level. And we're getting some incredible responses of how important just the fact that EDA is incentivizing these partnerships. Just to close, um, I will invite you to truly pay attention at the EDA, what the Economic Development Administration is doing. In the next 45 days, you will see a number of notice of funding opportunities, including tech hubs. I know that there's uh, a lot of 
excitement, and there should be a lot of excitement because truly, I've lived in this town for a very long time, and this is something I have never witnessed. But I'm going to borrow from the words of Senator Young. This is the moment where all of you have a voice. Yes, Tech Hubs was, was authorized at $10 billion. However, it was appropriated in the omnibus bill at half a billion dollars. It's great, it's a down payment, I'll take it. But it's not enough to move the needle in the way that we and our nation deserves. So your voices, the voices of all these different stakeholders is going to be essential and critical as you um, talk to your members of Congress. Um, I know that uh, Tom will make this a very robust conversation and I'm looking forward to it, but I leave you with this. The moment for not only economic development is now, the moment for our, to ensure that our national security is well protected and well developed is now. The moment to make sure that people and places are visible. I will submit to you that all, while this is also about economic development and national security, it's also about our democracy. If we don't invest in those places that feel left behind, it frays our democracy. This is an opportunity not just to jumpstart different industries, the industries of tomorrow, but also to make sure that we are investing in those places that have so much to offer. So I wanna leave you with that. It's more of a tug at the heart because I know you're all incredibly smart people, but this too is important. That, dem that notion of how do we rebuild our democracy, how do we allow folks to have a decent job. And this is, it's very empowering to me. So thank you, and I look forward to the discussion with the panel. Thanks again. Thank you, Secretary Castillo. Our next speaker is Erwin Giancandani. He is the Assistant Director for the U.S. National Science Foundation's Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships, leading the newly established TIP Directorate. Prior to becoming the Assistant Director for TIP, he served as Senior Advisor for Translation, Innovation, and Partnerships, where he helped to develop plans for the new TIP Directorate in collaboration with colleagues at NSF including other government agencies, industry, and academia in that planning effort. During the previous six years, Gia Chandani was the NSF Deputy Assistant Director for Computer and Information Science and Engineering, twice serving as Acting Assistant Director. He holds a PhD in Biomedical Engineering from the University of Virginia. In 2021, Dr. Gian Chandani received the Distinguished Presidential Rank Award awarded to members of the federal government's Senior Executive Service for sustained extraordinary accomplishment. Dr. Gian Chandani. All right, good morning, everybody. Oh, come on, we can do better than that. Good morning, everybody. There we go, excellent. Uh, so first of all, Tom, thanks very much for that kind introduction, and uh, my thanks to CSIS for organizing this event. I think this is a fabulous opportunity for us to really have uh, a, an in-depth conversation about issues that are really at the heart of what we all care about passionately when it comes to uh, being able to think about innovation and entrepreneurship and talent creation uh, and impact, positive impact on society in every corner of our country. Um, so I recognize some faces around the room, but I certainly don't recognize everyone, and I imagine that some of you are less familiar with the National Science Foundation uh, as part of the federal government. Um, NSF has been around as a federal agency for more than 70 years, and in that time we have stewarded investments in basic research uh, in all different areas of science and engineering, and contributed to uh, the devices that we all walk around with today, the resources that we use online to be able to do search and searching, uh, to MRIs and barcodes and all kinds of other technologies that we rely upon in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, having said that, I think that 
the reason we're all here today uh, is because the NSF of today is not the NSF of 20, 30, even 10, even five years ago, potentially. Um, you know, the Chips and Science Act for us, and, and I certainly um, uh, agree with everything that uh, uh, Assistant Secretary Castillo said about the, the breadth of legislation that was passed over the course of the last six, nine, 12 months or so. But for us at NSF, the Chips and Science Act in particular is seminal. Uh, and the reason it's so important to us is because that legislation, in addition to the billions of dollars that were appropriated for chips uh, and trying to ensure that the U.S. reshores chip manufacturing and, and so forth, um, in addition to all of that, that legislation authorized the establishment of this new directorate at the National Science Foundation called Technology Innovation and Partnerships. Uh, the first time, in fact, in more than three decades that NSF has stood up a new directorate. So this is certainly not something that we take lightly, and it's not something that we do every day. Uh, and in many ways, as you heard the senators speak about earlier, uh, this is a generational opportunity for us at NSF, uh, but it's also a generational opportunity for all of us all across the country. Uh, and the reason I think in many ways that this legislation came to be, and you heard the senators speak to this, is that from a national competitiveness perspective, we as a nation face intense global competition in a number of different technology areas. Semiconductors, yes, but artificial intelligence, advanced wireless, biotechnology, quantum information science, the list goes on. We also recognize that we face socioeconomic challenges today that are prevailing and that are driving a number of factors in our daily lives, whether it be the climate or critical infrastructure or issues of equity and inequity when it comes to access to education and healthcare and so forth. And at the same time, uh, I think that we have, as a federal government, as an agency at NSF, invested heavily in research and development, but perhaps not equitably across the country. Uh, and there are a lot of millions of Americans who are missing from the STEM enterprise that drives our nation's economy on a day-to-day -day basis. And so those three factors, that global competition, that uh, socioeconomic set of challenges that we face, the missing millions, those three factors together with the fact that our research enterprise in and of itself is evolving. We see that the pace of discovery in science and engineering is increasing with access to data and sensing and other capabilities. We see that today's early career researchers and students care a lot about coming into STEM so that they can make a positive impact on society. They saw what transpired with the COVID vaccines and how science was at the root of that and they want to be able to, in their own way, shape positively outcomes. And where that talent ends up is increasingly distributed no longer just at our institutions of higher education, but in industry, in government, in nonprofits. And so it's incumbent upon us to catalyze the partnerships that bring together these varied perspectives to help address some of these challenges. And so those factors together in many ways is what we believe leads us to this paradigm expansion moment. Folks often call it a paradigm shift. I'm going to call it a paradigm expansion moment for us uh, here in the U.S. and for us at the National Science Foundation. We have invested heavily for 70 plus years in researchers at academic institutions who do great work and then we try to push the research results out into the market and into society. And what we need to do increasingly is bring that constellation of the users, the beneficiaries of that research to the table to help shape the research agenda that we're going to pursue, to help motivate the research questions, to work collaboratively hand in glove with the researchers. And so in some sense, that market is now coming to the table and demanding or pulling out the research results at the end of the day. So a little bit of a paradigm expansion from us from strictly tech push to much more market demand. And that in many ways is the essence of what we're trying to do with the TIP directorate at NSF, to really hone in on use-inspired research, to hone in on being able to accelerate the translation of research to practice in meaningful ways. And when we do that, uh, we too have a flagship effort that 
uh, Alejandra and I have talked a lot about because of the synergies between our effort and the tech hubs. We call it the Regional Innovation Engines Program. And for us, the engines program, you know, if you think about the engines and the tech hubs, they are gonna work together at the end of the day. The engines starting from a place of research and feeding forward to be able to bring together that ecosystem in a particular region, to put that region on the map for a particular technology area or a particular societal or economic impact area, that is that region's potential for competitive advantage relative to other parts of the country. And to, in many ways, engage parts of the country, those regions that frankly have been left behind for too long, but where there is clear and pressing evidence of folks who can come together, who have shared interests, who have expertise that can be honed and shaped, if only we were to provide the resourcing and we were to provide the framework to be able to enable that effectively. And in many ways, these engines we see as feeding into the tech hubs that our colleagues at EDA and Commerce are looking to stand up. And so the, the Regional Innovation Engines for NSF serves as a flagship effort with significant investment that we hope Congress will continue to bestow upon us as we move forward. Uh, but it serves as one of those flagship investments focused around use-inspired research and trying to be able to build capacity and really engage diverse talent from all corners of the country. We also care a lot about building up translational capacity. You heard the senators talking about that earlier, uh, about their experience at Arizona State or University of Arizona and Indiana and elsewhere. Well, it's incumbent upon us to create opportunities at universities to have the capacity, to have the structural support so that folks can really take part in that translational activity and help get research results out into the market and society more r rapidly than we're doing today. And we have an effort that we've launched around accelerating research translation to build that capacity at institutions of higher education that maybe have strong fundamental research efforts, but not as strong translational efforts today at, in the moment. And then finally, the third piece of this that's so important to us is around talent creation. You heard the Assistant Secretary talk about it. It's about people at the end of the day. And it's about allowing opportunities whether those be practical experiences, whether it be uh, mechanisms for internships or apprenticeships, how do we give opportunities for talent at all levels? We're known as an agency that supports graduate students, but we need to think about our community colleges, a treasure trove of talent in our country, diverse talent. We need to think about four-year schools. We need to think about individuals who are in the workforce today who may be interested in doing a pivot into a high-tech trade space if only they had the opportunity to be able to experience what that looks like. So we've launched an effort called Experiential Learning for Emerging and Novel Technologies to start to take the first steps to be able to do just that. So at the end of the day, you know, you're hearing this a lot this morning, this is definitely our moment but it requires all of us working together to be able to seize that moment. We can't do it just the two of us. We can't do it just those of us who are in the room today. It requires the entire nation to really come together in lockstep to be able to move in this direction. And if we do that, we will be able to not only accelerate technology competitiveness for the nation, but we will do so in a way that takes advantage of one of our unique and I think pressing uh, opportunities for competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis other nations in the world, which is the diversity that exists all across the country. If only we can harness the geography of innovation and the demography of innovation. As my boss, the director, likes to say at NSF, this is about creating opportunities everywhere, and it's about inspiring innovation anywhere. So thank you all very much, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Chia Chandani. Our third speaker is Dr. Allison Smith. Dr. Smith is the Microelectronics Commons Technical Director. The Commons is within the Microelectronics Principal Director's Portfolio in the Deputy Chief Technology Office for Critical Technologies within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Prior to the Commons Technical Director position, 
Dr. Smith was a member of the Defense Microelectronics Cross-Functional Team, where she led the Microelectronics Workforce Development Strategy. From 2016 to 2020, she served as the inaugural Chief Engineer of Materials Analysis for the Microelectronics Component Technologies of the Naval Surface Warfare Center Crane Division. She is the 2018 recipient of the Samuel J. Heyman Award, commonly known as the Sammies, to those of you who are in the Federal Service, for her work in the area of nanoarchitectural design. She holds a doctorate in materials chemistry from Indiana University. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Tom. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, and thank you, CIS, um, CSIS, excuse me, for organizing this discussion about regional impacts. So I do have to provide a, a disclaimer before beginning, because Microelectronics Commons is in source selection. The request for solutions, or RFS, closed in late February, so there are some topics such as um, proposers and specific topics that were proposed that will be off the table but there are lots of things that I can share and we are looking forward to announcing the microelectronics commons hubs in August of this year so I clicked and nothing's happening there we go oh it went twice all right, so let's talk about microelectronics commons. Um, the commons aims to enable lab to fab prototyping in domestic facilities. So it's an onshore lab to fab capability. At the same time, it aims to develop that talent pipeline in parallel. And so we currently, um, researchers such as universities, startups, uh, other innovators in that ecosystem face a lot of barriers to demonstrating manufacturing in a lab, right? But demonstrating at scale viability is required to move from an idea to full realization of that idea, right? And so these core facilities or fabs and foundries provide access to early stage fab prototyping, but again, those sources of innovation oftentimes face barriers to accessing those. And so what Commons aims to do is to evolve those lab prototypes to fab prototypes and again at the same time develop that talent pipeline for the six technical areas that you see on either side of that slide. Those areas are critical to the Department of Defense. So Commons will be supporting that lab to fab prototype development of microelectronics hardware for those six technical areas. That includes things like materials, processes, architectures, as well as devices. And so I discussed that there were a number of barriers for you know, those innovators to have access to that lab prototyping capability. So one of the things that Commons aims to do is to lower that barrier so that we can have democratized access to the capabilities needed for lab to fab prototyping. It is very important um, and especially relevant since we're here today to talk about the regional ecosystems for us to look at who we're reaching out to, right? Um, and so we do that from day one. Um, are the bulk of the folks who are right interacting with us through innovation days, through industry days, are they non-traditional defense partners, right? Or are they traditional? Are they coming from small business sectors or big business? And also, are they coming from academia or others? So, you know, we really need to ensure that those folks who need that access are going to be able to have that access. And so when I talk about innovation barriers, there are many, but I will just mention a few. The very high cost of digital infrastructure, such as electronic design automation tools, um, lack of access, as I mentioned, to 
um, fabs for that lab to fab prototyping. And then also a lack currently of a workforce talent and expertise needed to support that ultimately technology transition. And so what success looks like for Commons is that we have sustained partnerships. Um, that is between these emerging technology sources and the manufacturers, as well as our interagency partners. And so I think the key word there is really sustained, right? We heard Senator Kelly say this is about long-term competitiveness of the regions. And we also heard Senator Young say it's about connecting those collaborators. And he also talked about needing to leverage our allies. So we're, we're talking about sustained, long-term, um, regional innovation hubs, those regional innovation hubs have to partner with national or even international right collaborators to fully be a center of technical excellence in one of those six areas I had shown earlier. And so I think that that's very important because while we're talking about building these regional communities, what kind of access are we providing them? Not just the physical infrastructure but also this human infrastructure, but also community building, right? So not just human infrastructure in the terms of who are the folks working in that hub and providing services out to the users to execute lab to fab, but what about collaboration pipelines and these connections to the collaborators? regionally, nationally, globally. And so I know that if my boss were here, he would say sustained, 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 right? Sustained is that key word there with the partnerships. But the other thing that marks success is rapid transition of technology. Right? It's not going to be just that evolution of a lab prototype to a fab prototype, but we have to do so rapidly. And at the same time, we have to expand that domestic microelectronics fabrication capability um, and enhance our regional microelectronics education to bolster those engineering workforce and ultimately also bolster those regional economies. And so finally, we see like this this investment that's required, right? When I said it's a huge barrier for over for them to overcome these um, Again, these small startups, right? These sources of innovation, these universities to overcome these high costs required to go from lab to fab. This is what I'm talking about. s and right, low early stage s and is not nearly as expensive as we move into this lab to fab transition. And that is the part that Commons is intending to help bridge. The, the highlighted section that you see there, and I know that Dr. Schnoy often says, this is not lab to market. Commons is about lab to fab. And so if you go to the far right, you see we also have to build these communities and these connection points with DOD programs such as demonstrators, also the defense industrial base, our interagency partners, and commercial industry. Because there has to be that handoff for further development as we talked about today and as many of the people uh, have talked about today in regards to technology transfer. Um, but also want to say that we work and we coordinate very closely with Commerce on the NSTC, as the NSTC does support later stage technology readiness levels, including um, to commercial market. And so with that, I want to thank everyone, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you all. Wonderful opening remarks from each of you. And uh, so I'd like to kick off our part of the conversation uh, with a couple of follow-up questions. Um, first, Erwin, I'll, I'll start with you and just ask you to proceed around. But each of your programs and initiatives envision regional hubs to innovate and develop technologies to achieve national economic and security goals. 
what are the broad indicators of success to you? And also sort of the second part maybe is even to dive down maybe another level, are there any uh, one or two specific key indicators that you would like to see from your regional partners uh, to report on as they work with your agencies to build their innovation commons? Yeah, that's a great question. So thanks, Tom, for that. Um, I think we all spend a lot of our time thinking about success indicators and so forth. And I, I'm grateful that you use the term indicators. Folks oftentimes use the phrase metrics, right? And, and while we can debate and litigate about metrics all we want, at the end of the day, I think it is about trying to be able to take stock a year in, two years in, three years in. Are the indicators trending in the right direction? Um, so I'll speak first for the engines program, and I think that my colleagues can speak for the, the various flagship investments that they have as well. Um, you know, NSF is often known as an agency that supports research, right, basic research. And the coin of the realm when it comes to research is papers and publications and conference proceedings and so forth. And while these engines start from a place of research, uh, and so we would expect to see some of that, you know, we're really looking at the end of the day at what is the impact? What is the impact of the investment that we're trying to make? Uh, so some examples in, in that dimension. Who are the partners who are coming together? Uh, what is the diversity of perspectives that are uh, coming together in a meaningful and coherent way for a particular engine? Uh, when I think about those partners, are they providing perspective to help shape the agenda for that particular engine? Are they in there helping to do piloting and prototyping of some of the research results? Are they engaging to help draw out the research results to have impact in that particular region? Uh, you know, we need to think more about uh, both the technological outputs that we're seeing and how that, those are translating into uh, patents and licenses and new startups, uh, how we're seeing potential follow-on funding. You know, I love the conversation on the previous panel about venture capital and, and other follow-on investment that needs to come to the table. That is too concentrated today in certain pockets in our country. And if we are able to stand up successful engines, that we hope will serve as a draw, as a lure, uh, as an enticement for some of those VCs and others to start to diversify their, I mean, some of them are doing it, but to further diversify their portfolios with these engines. So technological outputs and some of those indicators that I just talked about are top of mind for us. And then there's a strong workforce component to this. I cannot stress that enough. Um, we, we should not think about this as strictly about research or technology. We should be thinking about it as the people whom we're training. And when we think about people that we're training, I think it's imperative for us to think about that as at all levels. So you think about a workforce on, a, on the fab floor, for instance, they're technicians, they're practitioners, they're researchers, uh, they're entrepreneurs, right? We also need to think about the teachers who need to be trained to, um, uh, or, or get professional development so that they can be ready to teach to industrial relevant and rigorous and engaging curriculum of the future. So what does that talent creation look like in terms of the outputs of individuals and how those individuals are diverse and reflective of uh, the, the population of a particular region? So those are some of the indicators that I think we're thinking about. Great, thank you. Erwin um, said it beautifully and, and accurately. Um, a couple of things I want to just underscore. When we hear the word tech hubs, in the past, it's been a building, right? A place, a very distinct and discreet place. And we call it a tech hub. This program is not that. This program is about regional economic development, regional technology and innovation engagement. Um, and regions um, can be, it, it's not just the city or the city limits or even the state limits. We're looking at truly much broader areas of the country that can come together um, in a shared vision uh, with an understanding of particular industries that um, they believe are going to um, drive uh, growth. But as Erwin said, <clears throat> I agree wholeheartedly. Um, how comprehensive, how hol holistic, are the consortia that are, will be created here? How authentic are they? 
Are they just coming together to pursue this grant? Are they really coming together to ensure that their community is at the forefront of that talent pipeline, uh, at the forefront of tech transfer, um, hopefully at the forefront of entrepreneurship, of creating that next generation of supply chain uh, or suppliers. So there are many indicators that we're looking at. Um, and universities are going to play a very important role, but they're not the only entity. Um, community colleges are going to play a role, nonprofit organizations. The state is going to play a role. The city is going to play a role. Um, and I say that because we could get very um, lost with talking about $10 billion, which is what it's been authorized at, at least in the case of tech hubs. But that's not, in, that's not going to be enough. We need to incentivize the state to be a partner. Um, and we're seeing that in, in many places with regards to Build Back Better. So there is a willingness from at the state level, at the regional level. Um, and, and I'll also say that um, you mentioned, Erwin, the, the creation of patents. That's why I mentioned that USPTO is part of commerce. That is one of the indicators that we're looking at. Um, and just to end uh, this, this particular answer is, we are thinking about tech hubs to not just start, grow, but also to retain companies here in the US. We don't want to do the same thing we did in the past where, yes, we were leaders in the semiconductor industry, but it all went abroad. We want to also make sure that we have conditions and incentives on the ground for companies to start, grow, and, re and remain, remain in the US. Yep. Well, there's not much left to add after that. <laughs> but I just want to reiterate, it would be the evolution of prototypes, right? Are these technologies maturing? How rapid are they maturing? As Erwin mentioned, is there follow-up, right? Is there follow-up investment, right? Uh, these technologies, once they've matured to a certain TRL, they, they have to be matured further um, all the way to market. And so that's very important, tracking the workforce. Are we developing the workforce that we need? And I think this was already mentioned too, but I really think that it's a critical piece. Who are the partners, right? Who, who, who is playing in this ecosystem? Yeah. Great, thank you. Alejandra, I'll start with you. We'll look at the other side of it, in part because uh, early keywords, partnerships, collaborative, collaboration, things that we encourage, but truthfully in the day-to-day -day, uh, world we live in, not always easy to do. So what do you see as potential threats or barriers to success in a region as it develops its technology and innovation commons? Uh, sure, so again, as, as was mentioned before, um, we're taking a, a two-step approach to, um, to tech hubs, particularly uh, on the side of how this program is going to um, uh, be administered. One is the, the first phase is looking at tech hubs with regards to um, uh, both the, the consortia, but also providing some planning grants. Um, so that's the, and I mentioned that because we are very aware that um, if we want to be as um, uh, support the success of this program, we need to build capacity on the ground. Right? Um, and currently, we've mentioned all of these different types of funding streams that are coming from the federal government, but we also have to acknowledge that at times, at the local level, we need to build capacity. So that's one thing uh, in terms of, I don't see it as a barrier, but I do, I think we are very alert that that is a challenge. Um, the second thing is making sure that the partners are coming to the table in a very authentic way, that we're able to have various voices um, going back to the equity piece, um, who's represented and who's not represented. So we wanna make sure that, again, we're moving these coalitions in ways that are engaging as many different stakeholders as possible. Um, and, and then the third thing I would say, uh, again, not looking at it as a challenge, 
but looking at it as a possibility and a place where we as government can do better is helping these uh, areas or these regions um, blend and braid other types of funding, uh, whether it's working with NSF uh, in some aspect uh, of the spectrum or working with Department of Energy, Department of Transportation, uh, working with national labs. We haven't spoken about national labs, and they are, too, a very critical piece to that. So again, um, I want to be as optimistic as possible. Uh, what we can see as barriers, I think there's opportunities there for partners across the federal government to support um, at the ground level how these regional um, tech hubs are going to be um, forming. Yeah, I just would like to follow up <clears throat> on the equity piece because it is the number one um, topic of feedback from the offer community when we talk about the hubs themselves, right? They often ask, how is it that we are going to have a fair and equitable say-so in the projects that we will execute? How can I be guaranteed that my ideas will be heard and that we don't just have the heavy hitters, right, of a regional innovation hub running everything? Um, and the answer to that is that we require governance structures that are indeed fair, but I think that that is something we will have to closely monitor so that we ensure the goal there is democratize access, right? And so I I think it's our responsibility that we monitor that and ensure that that is actually executed throughout these hubs. So I'll just be brief since my colleagues have, um, have I think, hit on some of the very key points that I would have hit as well. Um, I'll just double down on two or three things. One is uh, capacity building. So we talk about partnerships, we talk about the genuineness of those partnerships, the meaningfulness of those partnerships. Um, I think any team that is trying to pull together a regional innovation engine or a regional tech hub or a component of the microelectronics commons, any of these teams is going to require support structures to be able to stitch together the meaningfulness of the partnership, to be able to understand how do I down the road secure additional follow-on funding, uh, to be able to learn from one another's best practices, to be able to understand that an output from one engine or tech hub might actually benefit another engine or tech hub, for example. And so I think trying to put in place the support structures that maximize the chances of success for any of these teams is something that's really imperative. It's why we've actually taken the step of launching a builder platform in the last couple of weeks to you know, help teams build, right? It's a platform to help teams build their engines or their eventually tech hubs or, or what have you down the road as well. So that's number one. Uh, the second point that I'll highlight, and it's very related to that, uh, I agree every, with everything that was said about equity, but I'm gonna focus on sustainment, sustainability long-term. And there's sustainability in the region, you know, so federal funds should not, cannot be the basis for success 20 years down the road, right? We're gonna provide funding for a period of time. There needs to be a gradual ramp down of the federal funding and a gradual ramp up of whatever sustainment looks like. And so I think it's not a barrier, it's, it's just something that we all need to have our eyes on as we think about this from the very beginning because too often we make investments and then worry about the sustainment later on down the road. And there's sustainment at the local and regional level there's also sustainment at the federal level too. And Alejandra touched on this in her opening remarks, so I don't think I need to say much more than what she said, other than to say, um, you know, these programs, uh, our, our colleagues on the Hill who were here earlier, you know, by definition, want to see success as quickly as possible. Success breeds further investment, breeds further success. Uh, but these things do take time. And so as much as we have momentum and wind at our backs, we also need, I think, a certain degree of patience from everyone involved and a recognition that these do require that sustained investment over the long haul. Allison, you uh, highlighted uh, a key term and another set of key words that we've heard this morning uh, from all of you as panelists as well as uh, from the senators. Uh, these words include democratization, diversity, inclusion, and you address that, and I'm, I'm really happy to hear how you address that. So I actually wanna go uh, to you two 
and and talk a little ask you to talk a little bit about how do we ensure that these investments are inclusive and bring real opportunity to those individuals and communities who don't possess the same advantages as existing innovation centers. How do we assure that that, that can happen? So, so I'll take a, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, um, as you know, we uh, at EDA uh, included equity as one of our primary investment priorities. Um, you can visit our website. It's not just in words, it's also in practice. When we look at the broad scope of uh, grants that EDA uh, reviews, we are looking at equity. Um, you will also probably see equity um, as a, um, a key selection criteria as well. Um, the engagement of the, the consortia or, or the, the partnership. So equity is in everything that we do. How do we ensure that? First of all, we have to communicate. Um, this is not necessarily the bread and the, the issues that are spoken about at the kitchen table in, in many of our households. We need, to we need to not only communicate, inform, empower people to see themselves in what we're all doing, right? Technology innovation, industries of tomorrow. Um, and that's part, a lot of my job is to go to communities, to, uh, expand on it. I was in, in Indiana with you um, uh, and, and the senator, making sure that all communities are hearing this message and also hearing this opportunity. Um, I've been to uh, Northern Flagstaff where I met with Hopi Tribe. Um, so looking at, as I mentioned before, not just the, the usual stakeholders, but asking ourselves the question, who's missing at this table? Um, who needs to be part of this table? Um, just a, a thing that I want, I want to underscore that Erwin said, and, and Tom, you know this very well, you know, economic development is not episodic. It needs to be, as Allison mentioned, long-term, sustainable. So not only is our educational campaign, so to speak, with folks outside of Washington, D.C., it's also with our members of Congress. Because you're absolutely right, Erwin. It's, everyone wants to see the success very quickly. Um, I also wanted to say that with, with regards to um, equity, it's the realization of how our country's uh, population is changing. Hence why I also mentioned that the Census Bureau is part of commerce. We are engaging the Census Bureau to make sure that we are looking at these regions, pockets of, of uh, population, making sure that we're engaging them and helping them see themselves as part of, as an essential part of the future of our country. So uh, a lot of work. Again, this is not an episodic, let's just go out and, and do this one time. It has to be consistent. It has to be sustainable. Um, and more importantly, we need to take this very seriously. Uh, equity is not a word. It has to be a verb. It has to be. Um, uh, something that we do in all the programs that we have. And that's been the commitment of the Biden administration. Um, one of the president's first executive order was to make sure that we're looking at equity across the board. Yep. So I'll just add to some of what uh, the assistant secretary said. I resonate with, with everything that she just said. Um, you know, I think from our perspective, when we launched the engines program, which by the way, it didn't occur to me until I was driving here this morning. We launched the program exactly a year ago today, as it turns out. Uh, and we are on the cusp of being able to announce the first round of awards for the type ones, the planning or developmental awards, as we call them. Um, you know, even before we launched the program, we had a series of listening sessions with diverse institution types. We talked to HBCUs, we talked to HSIs, we talked to tribal colleges and universities, we talked to two-year universities, community colleges and technical schools. And we did that because we wanted to try to ensure that we had a better understanding of the perspectives that these diverse institution types can bring to the table and can bring to an effort like the Regional Innovation Engines program. Uh, and we tried to infuse into the funding opportunity that we issued a year ago today, language that speaks to some of the challenges, some of the pain points, 
that have historically prevented these diverse institution types from being able to engage in federal funding opportunities, let alone in something as large and significant as an engine uh, type program. Uh, so starting from even before we launched the program to then how we wrote the funding opportunity to then how we conducted the review process or are conducting the review process for some of the type twos, the larger fuller engines that we hope to award later this year. You know, at each step of the way, we've tried to design in, if you will, from the start, a consideration of diversity and equity and inclusivity and accessibility into everything that we're doing and how we're shaping it and structuring it. Um, it's actually part of the reason why uh, we did two things with this program. Number one, we uh, put out a call for both type ones and type twos. So planning activities as well as full-fledged engines. There are some communities, there are some regions, there are some partnerships and coalitions that are ready today to jump full throttle ahead into an engine activity. And then, then there are others that need more time and more resourcing to and, and capacity building structures to better position themselves for that fuller engine competition. And so it was intentional in that regard, number one. And the second thing, something that NSF did with this program that we never do, I was so proud of the agency to take this step, right? That we put out a call for concept outlines from the community, three page write-ups if you were interested in a type one, five page write-ups if you were interested in a type two. So not a lot of effort, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's, it's effort, it's a lot of effort. But not as much effort as a 15 page or 20 page proposal might require, right? To just get the word out there about this is the team that's coming together in early days, this is the concept, and this is the region of service that we're exploring potentially having impacted. And we then published all of those concept outlines, close to 700 of them. And we did that with the intention of Yes, drawing a buzz to the program, of course. But more importantly, being able to say that if I'm a community college in this region and I'm a four-year R1 institution in this region and I'm a company in this region and I'm all three of us are, turns out, working in the same technology space and working in a relatively similar region, let's encourage teaming, let's encourage partnering. Let's worry a little bit less about who is the lead for the effort and more about who are the partners who are coming together because you need those genuine, meaningful partnerships from diverse perspectives to be able to tackle some of these challenges and some of these technology areas. We all know how in certain technology areas it is incumbent upon us to ensure, and really all technology areas, incumbent upon us to ensure that those who are designing the technology and developing the technology are reflective of the population that's going to use that technology. And so that's something that we've tried to ingrain into the DNA, if you will, of this program from the very beginning. Tom, if I can just piggyback. Um, Aaron, you, you, you touched on something very important. The transparency element of how we not only design but implement these programs has been, um, is very important. And as you know, going after a federal grant is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> but the fact that we're able to post yeah. the applications, the, the, the concepts, and for folks to be able to see who's, who's involved, what are the ideas, that brings down um, the fear but it also raises the trust that they, that individuals across communities can see themselves, oh, I have a similar idea. I, I think I can either partner with you or go a different route. So the transparency component in how we're, we're working through these massive programs, these are very large programs, is, is also a key element on, on how do we embrace the, the equity piece. Great, thank you. Um, just very quickly, and then we may have time for one or two questions from the audience uh, as well, but uh, Alejandra, you already mentioned partners that you're working with. Uh, do you have any partners you know, within the federal service, state, local, even international, that you think are important for uh, uh, regions to pay attention to in terms of developing their own expertise and capabilities? Well, with regards to the regions, yes, they should definitely be partnering across local, state, federal, and, and mm -hmm. other. And, but for the microelectronics commons planning and the rollout and the intersects, right, with other activities external to commons, we work with NSF, we work with the Department of Commerce, 
particularly with the NSTC planning. We work with the Department of State as we think about partnering with our allies. Um, and so, so it's a broad set of interactions across the federal government. But for those people who will be hub leads and within members of hubs, of course, they should be collaborating across all levels. Okay. Anyone, any, anyone else in terms of key partners that are worth mentioning? You know, we, we've talked about, uh, maybe, maybe the one thing I'll say that we haven't touched on as much is how much we work together within the interagency, right? So we've talked about industry, nonprofits, foundations, state, local, tribal, governmental organizations, uh, economic development entities at, that, at those levels. Um, I mean, the list goes on, civic leaders. But I think that we should, we should acknowledge that, you know, I've been in the government or around the government for, uh, in the government for more than a decade, around the government on and off for more than, uh, for almost two decades now. And I think the level of collaboration, the level of engagement that we have, this is not the first time we've seen each other in the last few weeks, right? Um, and this is not the first time that many of us have been on a panel together, as a matter of fact, right? But, but that's publicly facing. That's you know, internally facing the number of conversations that we have and our teams have are at an unprecedented level from my perspective. And it's because this, for this to work, for us to be effective, for us to be able to communicate the story of what we're trying to do with regard to how engines and hubs work together, with regard to how the microelectronics commons feeds into this ecosystem, with regard to how some of our other programs and investments also are a part of this. That requires, I think, actual boots on the ground, roll up the sleeves discussions um, and starting from the level of how, do we, how are we going to write it in the funding opportunity to how are we going to communicate it to how are we actually going to see some of our investments pave their way to yours and vice versa. So I think that that level of engagement, and it's not just our agencies too. When we rolled out the engines program, we got phone calls and emails, well, emails, we don't do phone calls anymore. Uh, we do Zoom calls instead. But we got emails and Zoom calls from a number of other agencies across the federal government that said, hey, we'd love to be able to see how we could dovetail with this opportunity as well. Great, thank you. Uh, we have time for a question or two maybe. Uh, 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 Chuck, if you, you have a question for our panelists? Uh, yeah, just very quickly. <clears throat> We're paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> We're paying attention to that. <laughs> well, that's actually my question. To what degree <clears throat> you were talking about have the uh, lab of fab and prototyping, and is it some discussion of perhaps some discussion of perhaps having a more muscular uh, SBIR to provide funding for these promising companies, uh, but also a level of coordination where they would. As you know, it's one of its strengths. It's very diversified across the agencies, particularly yours. <clears throat> but it's uh, an opportunity to focus funds where it's most needed, help de-risk, and then pass forward to, uh, towards uh, private equity. And just very quickly uh, for our online audience, the, the question was about the SBIR program. If you just have a quick answer for and Dr. so Wessner. certainly I didn't list all of the pathways or potential pathways for transition out of commons right on the way to market. SBIR is certainly one of those pathways, um, but, but there are many. So, so I'll, I'll just echo what, what, what was just said. Um, uh, it's no accident, maybe, maybe the short answer to your question is it's not an accident that when we established the TIP directorate, into TIP moved programs like SBIR, STTR, Partnerships for Innovation, the NSF i program, which other agencies have adopted as well to provide entrepreneurial education. We really see this notion of um, lab to, so we're going to call it market, forgive me, but lab to market, lab to society, right? We really see that as directly tied to the engines that we're trying to stand up and eventually some of these other investments as well. So what we're trying to create is a synergistic set of intertwined programs so that an engine we fund might, some of the players there might be able to take advantage of the NSF SBIR program. They might be able to take advantage of one of the i hubs that's in their region, right? So, so that is absolutely very much a key goal of, of ours when we think about this portfolio of programs that we're trying to stand up. Yes, Sujay.
Thank you. Uh, really rich uh, discussion. Uh, Secretary Castillo, you mentioned uh, you know, the growing importance of federal and state partnerships. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more in terms of how these are growing, what some of the challenges are of articulating <coughs> a more constructive federal-state uh, relationship in these, new, in these new partnerships as you're describing them? Thank you. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, and, and I was going to interject when, when Tom was asking, what, who are the other partners? I mean, we work with National Governance Association, uh, National Association of Counties and, and Mayors, the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, and, and I'll give you the answer from what we've seen with, for example, the Build Back Better. The Build Back Better, a billion dollar challenge, um, what we saw was the federal dollars for those who um, were our finalists, um, or I should say our, our awardees, they received anywhere between 25 to 65 million dollars. At the beginning, what we saw was states were saying, if you are successful, we will invest 20 million dollars, 30 million dollars. From where I sit, I was, said, I, I was puzzled. I, I, I was wondering why did they make it conditional on winning? After the awards were announced, what we saw and what we continue to see is that now states and the cities are actually investing dollar, public dollars as well. Um, because when the federal government takes that first risk, it generates and incentivizes others to come in. And it's been really fascinating to see just from the Bill Back Better what's happening and how much excitement is happening on the ground. And we hope that that will be a similar effect with tech hubs. Um, the other thing I would say, and I know we're, we're about to close, is that much of the dollars that you're also seeing with um, uh, you know, bipartisan infrastructure law and, and uh, chips is that there's a lot of funding going from the federal government to the states. So in some ways, I, I invite folks to see that we've had a federal strategy most of the time. Now we need to also engage a state-level strategy. Um, and, and all of these pools of dollars is what I meant by saying blending and, and, and braiding uh, both federal, state, and local dollars to ensure that this is sustainable and successful across the board. Yes, can I just make one sure. Plus Excellent. one to everything that the Assistant Secretary said. This is sort of related to your question, but the, the way in which you answered it inspired me to make this other comment too, which is I think we also, I think we agree with this, but we need to do a better job of communicating this to the, to the, com to the community and to the nation. We need to rethink the definition of success at the end of the day, right? So we're going to be able to fund some number of engines. You're going to be able to fund some number of tech hubs over time and so forth, right? Microelectronics Commons. There are 700 concept outlines. We're not going to be able to fund 700 concepts, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that the ones that we are not funding are failures. They are every bit as much a success. There are only so many dollars that the federal government has access to that can flow out. But those are also success stories. And we are hearing many anecdotal examples of instances where teams have submitted proposals. They're waiting to hear. But they're not necessarily waiting to begin the work because their community, their region is jazzed. And yes, some of the funding may be predicated on what the federal government does first, but some of the intellectual capital and horsepower is already there and ready to go. And I think some of these teams will proceed even if they don't get funding from the federal government. And that is a form of success in terms of the spark that this investment writ large, this legislation, these programs is able to provide. Great, sorry. Well said, well said. All good? Okay. Well, uh, we've reached the end of our time, and I'd like to thank our three panelists, uh, Dr. Allison Smith, uh, Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Economic Development, Alejandro Castillo, and Assistant Director Erwin Giancondani, uh, and uh, for uh, your wonderful comments and insights, taking the time to help inform regions uh, and help them do a better job of achieving our national and economic uh, priorities. So with that, I'd uh, just like to ask if we could give our panelists a hand. And then ask our audience members uh, to stick around. We'll take a few minutes break and then we'll start with another panel in just a few moments. Thank you.
I think it's, <clears throat> it's important to understand that uh, there are uh, 100 uh, viewers on, uh, on YouTube and another, another 50 on LinkedIn, uh, so we're not entirely alone here. And we're <clears throat> building out a, uh, a record here, which I think is important uh, on some of the issues that need to be addressed. <clears throat> to start that to start that process, uh, we're going to be talking about this uh, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, and the advantage of this panel is that we're going to be talking about that opportunity in concrete ways, uh, where you have uh, representatives of three, uh, three major corporations uh, who are, <clears throat> in large part, uh, market leaders in, in what they do. Um, and we, um, the first speaker that we have today uh, is uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Kathleen Kingscott, known to many of her friends as Taffy. Um, she's now a senior strategic advisor for IBM Research, responsible for developing collaborative research partnerships between IBM industry and academia and government. Um, She's been a representative to the SIA. Uh, she is widely known in Washington uh, as a very effective advocate, not only for IBM, but also with a broader perspective on <coughs> the American innovation ecosystem uh, and the challenges it faces, and particularly with regard to our, perhaps one of our most, our most high-tech industry, that is the semiconductor industry. Uh, she also has a strong commitment to public service. She <clears throat> is a member of the National Academy of Sciences Innovation Policy Forum, something that was set up by Dr. Shiva Kumar here in the office and myself at the National Academy a little over a decade ago. Uh, and uh, I've had the privilege of collaborating with, uh, with uh, Taffy for uh, more years than either of us want to admit. So uh, we, look, uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Chuck, for that nice introduction. And um, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I really appreciate it. This is really an exciting moment for us in the semiconductor industry and I think in the IT industry at large. And um, it's really time for the United States to step up its game. 
in the semiconductor industry in particular, because you think about what's going on around the world. Uh, China is investing $150 billion in the semiconductor industry. The EU has just put forward a bill for about $43 billion in semiconductors. India has announced investments of about $30 billion. Uh, Japan, $6.5 billion or so. Korea, I can't remember the exact number, but it's a ton of money. And then you look what's happening in places you really wouldn't even expect. Um, the Philippines, Malaysia, Costa Rica, Mexico. This recognition that semiconductor industry investment is critical is taking place all around the world. So to paraphrase Winston Churchill, um, it's not the end. The passage of the CHIPS Act was great, but it's not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. It's the end of the beginning. And here we go. So let's hope I can make these screens work. Okay. So why do we think in the IBM company uh, that the CHIPS Act is so significant? And one of the reasons we do is because it does enable the expansion of the semiconductor ecosystem. And uh, we've heard that from many people this morning already, how important the semiconductor ecosystem is, and we really believe that to be true. So what you see here in the slide is a, um, a depiction of the, the facilities that exist today up in Albany, and my colleague Dave Anderson is going to talk about that a little bit further. But basically, it's a, the Albany Nanotech facility has been built up over about 20 years. IBM has been a core tenant there since that time, but it's been a collaborative effort that's invested over $15 billion over the last 20 plus years, from a lot of it from New York State, an awful lot of it from New York State, and an awful lot of it from the corporate partners that participate there. So one of the things that we've learned in, in working there is how to build a, an ecosystem. And this is not very simple, it's very complex. When you think about, you've got the IP terms that have to be worked out, and that was talked about, discussed a little bit earlier, a couple times today. You have lots of different kinds of organizations to coming together with different interests with respect to IP. So how do you construct an IP agenda that works for an ecosystem? How do you ensure that the work that you're doing in a proprietary manner isn't unfortunately disclosed to others, and ha but how do you take the work that is done jointly and keep it in that joint kind of open environment? Um, how do you work with international collaborators? Not just the US companies, but if you look at the companies there on our slide, you can see there are a number of global companies that are involved that have come together to work with their uh, other colleagues in across the industry, the face of the industry, to make something unique happen, and that is to create technology opportunity for the whole ecosystem. And we think that's really, really important. Um, another aspect of uh, the value that the CHIPS legislation has created is that it has served as a catalyst to bring a whole host of people and organizations together to create a p potential for technology road mapping. And so today, for instance, we've been working, we at IBM, along with a whole 200 plus organizations and with 400 people working to develop a draft technology agenda that could be implemented immediately upon the um, creation of this National Semiconductor Technology Center. So if you look at the elements of this potential technology agenda, uh, you can see that there are deep areas of study, whether it's in advanced memory, um, advanced logic, analog mixed signal, heterogeneous integration, and, and biotech. And then across all of those various technical areas, there's a body of work that needs to be done in a whole variety of other areas, such as materials, design, EDA, security, importantly, how can you apply packaging, advanced packaging, to these various technologies, and what do we do about demonstrators? So the CHIPS legislation has, in, has catalyzed the creation of this co coalition of companies and organizations, not companies, big, large, small, startups, uh, universities, not-for-profits, government labs, all coming together to try to create a technology agenda that can be dri driven forward here in the United States 
and done quickly, building off of existing infrastructure. So the CHIPS legislation has enabled these organizations to come together, has encouraged them, and the outcome is that it increases speed to market, increases, um, or reduces the cost, and reduces the risk of technology creation and generation. So here's an example. For instance, one of the things we've been working on, and this was brought up earlier in one of the um, discussions, is how do you um, democratize chip design? The problem with chip design is it's very expensive. You have to have access to very expensive tooling. You have to have access to process knowledge and to expertise. So it's a, it's a incredibly important aspect of semiconductor technology that is hard to get into the mix if you're a startup, if you're not highly well-funded. Well so part of the uh, work that we've been doing is to bring together the EDA companies like Cadence and Synopsys, Siemens, Open Road, and work with them in, to develop opportunity for EDA work in an open cloud environment, a secure and open cloud environment that makes it possible to have affordable and secure design for um, controlling the IP, controlling the PDAs, uh, PDKs, and providing access to the tools. This is just one of the potential outcomes of this kind of CHIPS legislation. Another area that we've been really excited about is, has been talked about just in the last panel in particular, which is regional economic development. And so the CHIPS legislation, and also s since the CHIPS legislation, but actually I think mm, encouraged by that, has been the creation of today the National, uh, excuse me, North American Semiconductor Corridor that has been discussed between the US, Canada, and Mexico. And this is an opportunity we've been looking at with a whole bunch of uh, partners as to how we can do this in, in the Northeast and build a Northeast Advanced Packaging Corridor based on existing infrastructure, which, um, goes across the border between the US and Canada. For instance, IBM has a, our packaging facility, the packaging facility that we had built 50 years ago. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary last summer. Um, and use that packaging facility in Canada with American technology um, and partner that with other institutions in that whole Northeastern corridor. And you can see on the slide there, University of Sherbrooke, which is right next door to the facility that IBM has, um, and they have a program called CT2, CD2MI, which is a, a research program, and we can do we could do research there, bring it into the packaging facility, connect it with the major semiconductor capability facilities in New York already that include um, uh, Albany, I, the site you just saw, Malta. Um, then down to Fishkill, uh, Yorktown Heights, and um, in, in addition to that, in Burlington, Vermont, there's a major facility of global foundries where Marvell is also there and IBM is also there. We could build this kind of a corridor um, based on the commitments that exist today that are an outcome of the CHIPS legislation. So we think this is really important, particularly because packaging is almost non-existent in the United States. We, in the United States, we only have about 3% of the packaging capability in the, in the world right now. And so we, it's a very serious shortfall of our semiconductor economy. And we need to address that. As, and we think this gives us the opportunity. So finally, I'll just say thank you for letting me come, having me. But I don't want to quit here. I want to, I want to lay it down the marker to say we have a lot left to do. We have a lot left to do with respect to building a governance structure, setting up tiers of membership, making it accessible to a whole variety of organizations. We need to really work out some IP terms that um, reflect the different kinds of organizations that are uh, in the community. We, we need to work on sustainability. We need to build a business model that enables an organization like this National Semiconductor Technology Center to exist beyond the five years of the CHIPS legislation funding? How do you get this to be something that has its own engine of growth included in it? We need to really uh, 
think about engaging small, medium, um, entrepreneurial kinds of enterprises and bringing them into the mix. And I haven't said anything about workforce development, but it's not because it's, I've left it here to the end so I can really pound on the importance of workforce development that the CHIPS Act and also the CHIPS and Science Act enables. It's really critical and we need to do it. And um, I thank you for your attention. I'll turn it back to you, Chuck. Thank you. I think there are a number of themes there that we'll look forward to exploring as we go forward. <clears throat> our, uh, our next speaker is Courtney Goodeldig, who is a Corporate Vice President of Public Affairs at Micron Technology. Um, I, I've always really enjoyed Micron Technology because it, <clears throat> it, it uh, kind of disrupts all the premises you have about regional development and, uh, <clears throat> and the importance of a local ecosystem. Um, and about venture capital because it was uh, helped critically. Uh, it was founded in Boise, Idaho, which well, when I, the time of founding was perhaps not a center of semiconductor development. And uh, it got critical support from an early stage investor who was a major potato farmer uh, on the corporate level uh, who recognized the importance in investing in, in a and a promising technology when the market was down. And uh, <clears throat> needless to say, Micron has, uh, has thrived despite violating the precepts of our economist friends. And, um, and it's also, uh, it's an illustration that we ha won't talk too much about today of the importance of trade policy. Because although we live in this wonderful cooperative world, if I'm not mistaken, a number of other companies were trying to put Micron out of business at ver various points in its history. Um, <clears throat> Although these days we, we pretend with one large exception that everyone loves us. Uh, it's important that, uh, that Courtney be here, uh, given the critical importance of Micron uh, uh, for the uh, semiconductor ecosystem here in the United States. She brings broad experience in, in government and public affairs from uh, Chime Financial and also as working as a Vice President for S&P Global, where she was responsible, again, for government relations and communications. We're very happy to have her here and uh, look forward to hearing from her. Do you have, do you have our slides? Do you know if you have the slides for my friend? Just ask for the slide tissue. Yeah. Okay. There we go. All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, so uh, Chuck stole my thunder a little bit on talking about the uh, the Boise potato farmer uh, origins of, of Micron. But uh, if any of you have read the uh, the Chip Wars book uh, by Chris Miller, there's a there's some interesting storied history of, of Micron in there, and it it, it is an interesting history and, and Chuck is right that uh, there's been a lot of, of, uh, of growth that Micron has found in downturns and since we are we're in a down cycle right now and there's there's a lot of as, as Taffy said exciting things happening uh, in a very complex world uh, you know we're, we're excited about the future for Micron right now so Micron was founded in Boise Idaho in in the basement of a dentist's office um, with, with some of the investment from J.R. Simplot, who was a potato magnet, and uh, Simplot still, for those of you who have been to Boise, there's an interesting Simplot uh, headquarters there that has a museum, and Micron is part of the Simplot history, so there's a lot of intertwined uh, history there for the company. But Micron is uh, the only semiconductor uh, memory manufacturer in the U.S. and the only uh, U.S. company doing that. Uh, we do have a global footprint, as you can see from from the, the slide we have up, uh, we have 45,000 team members uh, and we are the fourth largest semiconductor company in the world. We are the uh, second largest uh, US-based company uh, behind uh, Intel. So uh, we do make memory chips and storage chips that are known as the often mispronounced uh, DRAM and NAND. Uh, 
Um, and we are distinguished, of course, from logic and analog, but not uh, well understood. So we have spent a lot of time educating the, um, the policy uh, class around why memory is so important to, uh, to the ecosystem. As, as Chuck mentioned, memory is everywhere. It is, uh, it's grown from about 10% of the global semiconductor industry revenue in 2000 to about 30% today. Uh, and those trends continue, uh, those growth trends continue largely uh, on the back of the, the data and uh, the, the boom in, in data across the, the uh, economy. Uh, you'll, you'll find memory in the same places that you'll find logic chips in a lot of, in a lot of cases in, in your phones, in your cars, um, medical devices, critical infrastructure, defense technology, um, artificial intelligence is, and, and data centers uh, for sure. But the, the growth really is, is a pretty fascinating in how quickly it, it's happening from, um, from iteration to iteration. So for example, in, uh, in 5G phones, you'll have 50% more uh, DRAM and twice the um, twice the NAND storage that you would have had in a 4G phone. So just the growth is pretty exponential from one iteration to the next. And uh, autonomous vehicles, our CEO likes to say they are data centers on wheels. Um, they they do have as much DRAM and NAND as you will find in the most advanced data center. So uh, memory is a really integral part of the. Um, of all the critical infrastructure and the, the growth that we'll see and the opportunities in, um, in the future. And, and I think that it's important that we understand that um, most of that is currently manufactured outside the United States. Micron is the only company that's manufacturing any memory and storage in the United States right now. And currently none of that is advanced technology. Uh, so we are manufacturing in our Manassas, Virginia facility. Uh, that's about 2% of the global memory and storage is manufactured here. Micron does all of it in Manassas, and none of it is leading-edge technology. Um, so as of today, uh, Micron will continue to be the only company that will be doing uh, the manufacturing uh, memory and storage on U.S. soil. But because of the Chips and Science Act, we will be We'll be manufacturing advanced technology here in the U.S. Uh, with the announcement of our two projects uh, in the U.S. The first one being uh, that we will start uh, initially start uh, our first project in Boise, Idaho, where we will be doing manufacturing in uh, right next to our, our leading edge R&D fab, uh, with the benefit of co-location of technology there. Uh, and and then we also announced late last year the uh, largest semiconductor fab facility in the history of the United States in, in New York State. And Taffy talked a lot about the ecosystem that, uh, that develops, uh, or that has been developing for a long time around semiconductors in New York State. And uh, we, were, um, we were very excited about the choice we made in central New York to do this for a variety of reasons, which I'll talk a little bit about, but, but uh, it is an enormous project, a very large undertaking. Uh, these things are very challenging to do in the United States, and um, the Chips and Science Act is making it possible, not, um, not necessarily easy, but possible, and we are very excited about doing it with our partners in New York State, including our, our partners in the semiconductor ecosystem like IBM. Um, and the partners in the state and local government uh, in New York, and, and the federal delegation too, uh, they have been very supportive. So our New York uh, FAB investment, uh, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with it, um, is going to be up to four 600,000 square foot clean rooms, total 2.4 million square feet of clean room space. It's approximately 40 um, U.S. football fields, equivalent of 40 U.S. football fields. This is a rendering of the, the project. Um, it's part of our strategy to increase the American-made leading edge memory uh, DRAM production to what will ultimately be 40% of Micron's um, uh, production of uh, global output for the next decade. Uh, right now we do about a little less than 10% in the US. So it's a really big shift for us to move to uh, nearly 40% of our output in the US. Uh, we were very impressed with New York from a, a lot of different perspectives. 
certainly uh, because memory is so expensive, uh, so capital intensive to manufacture, the incentives that, that New York State was able to put on the table by passing the green chips legislation were really critical for us in making that final decision. But the diverse talent pool and the university system and the community colleges and the workforce that existed already in New York State from the ecosystem uh, around semiconductors was really important to us because we are building a greenfield site there. And Taffy talked at the end of her talk about workforce, and I know we'll get into that more. But that is something we are investing in early because we have to build a pipeline for, for a workforce there. Uh, a, a little less than 50% of our workforce there will not need a college degree. So we are, we're, you know, this will run the whole gamut from our construction workforce, which is very specialized, uh, all the way up through our uh, engineers, and we'll need to build that out. So we're doing a lot of work to do that now. Um, the clean water, the, um, the, the land, the size of the land, as you can see from the size of this project, we needed to have access to that, uh, that size of a piece of land. There were not very many sites in the U.S. that could hold a project that size. Uh, energy, access to energy. We have a power substation on the property. Uh, so all of these things together made this a very, uh, very attractive site for us. Um, the, the location itself was, is a very appealing place for, um, so it, Bruce can tell you he's from the area, but there's a, there's a lot of uh, great outdoor living there. It's a great place for employees to want to be. And, you know, we, we have come to really understand how passionate the people of central New York are about central and upstate New York. And so uh, there is really great enthusiasm in the community around this project. Um, the, the job creation element uh, will, will be about 9,000 direct micron jobs and um, around 40,000 community jobs that are in direct impact. 7,000 construction jobs at the height of the project. Uh, and because of how um, much investment uh, memory needs to do, continuing to turn over tools and, um, and keeping construction jobs on site. We'll probably have anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 construction jobs that will stay in place throughout the, the life of the, the project, which is a 25-plus you know, year project. So pretty significant for the construction industry. We are, um, we are also really motivated by the veteran and the military population there who come to, the, um, who come to this with, with a whole lot of uh, basic skills that we can enhance and, and use some of our workforce training programs to, to build on. So there's a sort of a uh, nice foundation for, for the workforce there, both on the construction side and uh, on the, the fab and the ecosystem side of things. Um, we, we, again, I, I, I don't want to belabor the things that Taffy already talked about, but the Albany Nanotech facility, the NSTC opportunities, the, the partnerships that exist that in the consortiums with Global Foundry there, uh, and IBM there, and the other um, things we're doing with NSF and building out uh, the Northeast Corridor for um, university partnerships, uh, really provide us with this great workforce pipeline that we can build out. Um, we've seen collaboration between the Boise mayor and the, the mayor of Syracuse already in, in partnering to, to kind of make sure that we can share resources across the two. So really just a, uh, a unique opportunity, I think, to, to do something uh, unique and different and take advantage of this, um, this particular set of circumstances. Like Taffy said, I think the, the Chips and Science Act was extremely important to us from the grant side of it, but for Micron, because the project itself is so capital intensive and is, is so long term, and these investments with, uh, with memory are so um, iterative, we, you know, we continue to change out our nodes so, um, so rapidly every you know, 18 months or so. The investment tax credit was a really important part of, of us being able to do this in the U.S. and being able to match what, what kinds of incentives we, we see come to play in other parts of the world. So for us, that was critical to this being um, a project that was economically viable in the U.S. And so we are, we're excited about what all of this means uh, for Micron, for memory, 
for the United States and for the entire ecosystem. Um, and, and there's lots more to talk about. There's certainly, I know we're going to talk about some of the challenges, so I don't want to make this sound like it's easy. It, it's, it's certainly not easy. There's a lot, lot of work to do, but it's exciting. So um, we'll be happy to answer any questions then. I'll turn it back over to Chuck. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think that is <clears throat> was an inspiring talk, not least because of what you're talking about and the idea of this type of a massive investment uh, in an area that, uh, as we talked about in the last panel, that <clears throat> uh, where some areas have been excluded from the uh, uh, <clears throat> the high tech universe uh, and high tech production. Uh, the promise for Syracuse is, is quite remarkable. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, despite its prominence, as you may realize, uh, uh, Micron is the, not the only game in the semiconductor universe here in the United States. Um, and our next representative, uh, Bruce Anders, Andrews, who is Intel's Corporate Vice President and Chief Government Affairs Officer, is with us uh, today. Uh, Sujay and I keep a special place for Intel. We worked for a number of years with uh, Gordon Moore in the National Academy of Sciences. <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me, interestingly enough, um, uh, 20 years ago, Gordon Moore thought it was essential that we learn more about government industry partnerships and how, and academia, and how, what kind of incentives can be, can be brought together. Um, uh, Mr. Howe, who's also here, we were joking about the uh, title of the book that came out of the work with Gordon Moore was Securing the Future, and arguably the future is here now, uh, and uh, uh, so is Bruce Andrews. So with uh, no more ado, I'd like to, you to come up and tell us what you're thinking. Great. Well, first of all, uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I will try not to live up to the old Washington adage, which is uh, everything's been said, but not everybody said it. Um, but, you know, look, so starting with, uh, I wanted to start with this slide because it gives you a little bit of sense. And this, this is Intel, uh, but to give you a little sense of our global manufacturing footprint. Uh, but one of the reasons we're here today and one of the reasons the CHIPS Act is so important is the need to build a geographically diverse manufacturing capacity. Uh, because unfortunately, over the last 30 years, because of government policies, um, you know, there's been a huge over-concentration in certain parts of the world, particularly in Asia. Um, you know, a number of governments, you know, Taiwan, Korea, China, to name a few, uh, have had very aggressive subsidy policies. So what you ended up with is a massive uh, concentration in certain parts of the world. And I think what the CHIPS Act is, is a recognition of two things. One is the U.S. has to have policies in order to uh, bring manufacturing back that can help make the U.S. competitive. And second is, particularly what I think we learned out of COVID and some of the other challenges, we do need geographic resiliency. If you're overly dependent, whether it's national natural disasters, whether it's geopolitical problems, there are a variety of things that can affect industries, uh, pandemics, uh, that if you're not geographically resilient, you end up with the challenge that we faced over the last several years, which is, you know, seeing many industries impacted, particularly because uh, semiconductors are so foundational to so many other products. So this gives you a little bit of a sense of where Intel is. And we're excited, you know, particularly here in the United States, uh, Oregon's our center for R&D, Arizona's our center for manufacturing, New Mexico, uh, we've got uh, um, ongoing investments there, and we've been there for a number of years, and then Ohio, which I'll talk about. But we also have got sites in a number of other places around the world. And it really is part of our strategy to try to be geographically diverse. So, 
we've recently announced a number of new investments. Uh, the biggest one, and I do, so one thing I will say I, I would have started with is uh, Courtney knows how envious I am of Micron building in my hometown. Uh, I am super jealous of that, and Courtney, for the record, that is absolutely true. Uh, all I do have to correct one thing, which is our Ohio investment is actually going to be the biggest uh, CapEx, slightly bigger. Uh, but uh, we have a, a number of different big investments going on. We're doing $20 billion for two new fabs in Arizona. Uh, we have an initial two fabs in the state of Ohio that's going to be built out to an eight fab mega site over the course of time. Uh, we have $4.5 billion investment in New Mexico. Um, so we're looking at about, well, a floor of about $43.5 billion in the coming years. We're also building a sister site to our Ohio uh, site in Germany. Uh, we're looking, uh, we're doing a new investment in Israel. Uh, we've got a, a new uh, smaller investment going in in Vietnam uh, and in Malaysia as well. But what this really reflects is we're in a geo, we're in a globally competitive world for semiconductors. And, you know, as I mentioned before, for years, other countries had been providing incentives to attract industry. And the reality is if the United States didn't compete, we couldn't produce here in a cost competitive way. Um, you know, you have all have probably seen the statistics, but um, you know, the, the oldest study says that the difference between manufacturing in the US and Taiwan is about 30%. Uh, more updated numbers, Goldman Sachs had a number about 44%. Uh, Morris Chang, the founder of TSMC, has said it's about 55% cheaper to build in Taiwan. You know, you can use, we, we can argue about the numbers, but the reality is probably somewhere in the 40 to 50% range, uh, which means if the U.S. wants to be globally competitive and we want companies to be able to compete around the world here, we have to do the programs that allow for that kind of competition. So the CHIPS Act was critical for two reasons. Uh, one is because the grants at the Commerce Department is going to help to close that cost gap to make up that 40 to 50 percent cost gap that we see. And then second, and Courtney mentioned the investment tax credit, which is critically important in order for companies that are manufacturing here to know what the uh, level of, of uh, investment they're going to get. And I think it is particularly ironic that, you know, even though if, you, if you've read Chris Miller's book, uh, Chip Wars, you know, for the other countries have been doing this for 30 years. But what we saw in response to the CHIPS Act is, uh, you know, an increase in subsidies everywhere else in the world. Uh, you know, Taiwan went and passed more, South Korea passed more, uh, India, Japan, everybody went back and said, oh, the U.S. is finally in the game, so let's add on more subsidies. Um, you know, so it, it is the time. It's, it's a competitive world out there. And uh, that's what makes this all, what we're here for, so important. So let me talk, and I particularly want to talk about Ohio, uh, because people know a lot about what we do in Oregon. Um, you know, Arizona, one thing I would note that, um, you know, the, the ecosystems that, that Taffy talked about, you know, and I think Arizona is a perfect example of that. I mean, it's not a coincidence that, uh, you know, Intel's been in, in Arizona for a number of years. We're building two new fabs, but TSMC moved to Arizona. Why is that? Because we have the concentration of suppliers. We built a workforce ecosystem working with partnership, uh, partner universities with Arizona State, with University of Arizona, with Maricopa County Community College. And so what that does is it attracts other companies to come. And that's one of the reasons we're so excited about uh, what's happening in Ohio. Because in the same way that Il Il uh, Intel is the company that puts silicon in Silicon Valley, uh, we're now creating the Silicon Heartland in Ohio. Um, you know, this initial Initial investment of more than $20 billion is going to build two fabs. Uh, but what it's also going to do, and this is one of the things that's so exciting, is we're hearing companies come to us and they say, hey, you're building this mega fab in Ohio. We want to be there with you. And uh, interestingly enough, you know, I, I should have brought the picture. Uh, you know, if you show Mr. Rondler's farm in Oregon in 1975, it's a big farm space with nothing in it. If you show the Intel Rondler Acres camp campus now, it's this huge facility that's not just Intel, but it's all kinds of other companies. It's NTT, it's Google, it's Microsoft, it's everyone and, and all of the big suppliers. And what they did is they came to be around the Intel facility because of the um, ecosystem system that it, uh, that it created. So what does this mean? You know, what does the CHIPS Act mean? I mean, the first thing is just massive investments. And I think uh, Courtney made reference to the amount of capital. According to SIA, $200 billion of capital has been committed. Um, you know, and we should talk about this in the challenges because one of the challenges
challenges, I think, is the Commerce Department's ability to do this, uh, or to give, you know, to give the money out in a, in a smart way. Uh, second thing is, is supply chain resiliency. Uh, we're going to start seeing, because you're going to have a bigger concentration of manufacturing here, we're already seeing suppliers trying to move to North America to be near that. You know, in order to make investments be successful, they have to have scale. Well, the CHIPS Act has unleashed the capital uh, that's going to create that scale and really give the ability to not be so dependent, particularly on Asia, for those sources of supply. And the last thing, and I mentioned this, but the transformation that's going to take place in these places, you know, whether it's Ohio, whether it's Syracuse, uh, I just think it's fantastic. And so uh, we're about to see a very changed world and one that's going to be better uh, for all of us. Um, so thank you for uh, here and happy to engage in the questions. So, um, those were three really very stimulating talks, and we're very grateful to, to have you here. Um, why don't we, um, there, I have a variety of questions for you. Um, I think what we got uh, to some degree is uh, one, what's the definition of success here? And uh, 200 billion sounds like a, a good start. Um, uh, but we're not here just uh, uh, just for love and ducks. It is uh, how <clears throat> how sure are those investments? What are what is needed to make sure those happen? Are there any potential roadblocks uh, out in front of you? Um, perhaps sure. you could take that up. Uh, and is this working? Do I need to turn? Oh, there we go. Okay, good. I mean, look, there there are a bunch of challenges as we look at this. Um, you know, there are a couple. One is, and I mentioned it briefly, uh, the Department of Commerce has been given $52 billion. That is a huge amount of money, except for it's actually not that much money, right? When you start breaking it down, I actually think their potential to spend that quite quickly uh, is significant. And so, uh, you know, number one is commerce doing it in a smart way, because ultimately making these fabs, and the fabs are the cornerstone, which brings everything else, um, making these fabs be successful in being able to uh, you know, clear the cost gap between the US and, and particularly Taiwan. Because frankly, if we can't, if the CHIPS Act can't help fill the cost gap, which that's what it was really designed for, that and the investment tax credit, you know, you're gonna create a bunch of fabs that won't be globally competitive. And that'll be a huge problem. Uh, so that's number one. Uh, number two is, uh, you know, we've been watching uh, for what restrictions are, are put on, you know, people who take the money. Um, you know, one thing that I will say is we, you know, we do this in countries around the world. There are very few restrictions put on the money. So the Commerce Department just needs to be smart about the restrictions they make and particularly not to penalize or limit companies that decide to take CHIPS money. Because what you don't want to do is actually make it harder for companies to take CHIPS money to be competitive, right? So it's creating the most competitive space. And then the last one, and then maybe I'll let Courtney talk about this one because I know this is important to them as well, is making sure that potential roadblocks are cleared. And one is, is NEPA, uh, which is obviously important. Um, but you know, if we're building a fab today, we don't have to comply with NEPA. If we take the investment tax credit, we don't have to comply with NEPA. Um, if we take the CHIPS money uh, from the Commerce Department, then we have to potentially be subject to a NEPA analysis and challenges. And that's something that I don't think was intended when they passed the legislation, because you're essentially creating an inequity between people who take CHIPS money and not take CHIPS money. But it's something that does have to be uh, understood and make sure that there's a clear path because nobody wants to be in a position seeing these projects delayed for years over challenges, particularly, and as Courtney mentioned it, you know, these are super clean. You know, we recycle our water, we're going to be um, energy, you know, net zero. We're going to do all these things to make them uh, environmentally friendly and very clean, uh, but still having to comply with that's challenging. Do you think you can get an exemption for that? I'm, I'm it's a very good question. I, we, we should have asked uh, the, the Commerce Department yes. folks, uh, because right now I think everybody's trying to figure out what is uh, a way to make sure that that doesn't become an unnecessary barrier. Uh, but I don't have an answer for you today. I don't know. I'll let Courtney answer that one. Yeah, no, I, no, I think Bruce, is, Bruce made some very good points. And I think uh, you know, the, the, the challenges uh, that we see are, are similar. I think. Um, Maybe I'll talk about NEPA first and then a couple of the other ones. But uh, I think the, the balancing act of 
of the things that you need to do or on, on the environmental side, which we obviously think are very important. I mean, Bruce talked about the sustainability goals and doing this in a, in a very um, focused way, which is an important value for Micron. I know an important value for, for Intel and, and IBM and, and all of our peers in this, in this industry because it's part of what, how, how we do our manufacturing. Uh, but, but I think the, the reality is that uh, in order for us to have the transformational impact that, that these fabs need to have and that these projects need to have, do them in the time frame that we need to do them in to, to meet the demand that's coming online for in the future, certainly for us, uh, we have to do the, and, and to be able to capture the investment tax credit, which, you know, in order for us to capture that investment tax credit, which is what makes this an economically viable alternative to doing these, these projects in the United, the United States versus Asia, um, we have to be able to start them by the end of 2025. And these, um, these NEPA reviews, these environmental permitting processes, which are one of the reasons that the U.S. has not been an attractive place to, to build for not just for us, but for, for a lot of different industries and manufacture here. They can take five, six, seven years in, in a lot of cases, and uh, we just don't have the time for that. And I think this was, this was an underestimated um, you know, challenge what going in, into this. None of us have done a, a project of this size or magnitude or, uh, with federal dollars involved in in the United States um, in, a, in a very long time, and so uh, everybody's trying to to kind of you know balance out that friction right now and figure it out alongside the politics of of uh, uh, election years and uh, Congresses with you know run by different bodies and and uh, I think there are different parties, and that's. That's a challenge that we're trying to navigate, and everybody is aware of the reality of this. And you're trying to do industrial policy in the United States for the first time for very important reasons, for national security reasons, for supply chain reasons, um, and you're also trying to balance the interests of, you know, other very important topics in the United States, like like environmental um, and sustainability topics. So I think we're all we're all aware of the very acute nature of getting this right, but also of the, the need to, to fix it and make sure these projects work. Well, you, you raised uh, uh, two things there. I'll turn to you, Taffy, in just a second. But I, I, uh, one of them is the sustainability of the, of the act. You know, we, uh, we tend to use time horizons that some people argue are a little short. Uh, and uh, I think that's you know, the investment tax credit is uh, one of the things that most worries some analysts is the idea that this is a one and done. Well, we've passed this, and so everything will be normal forever and ever, and that the NSTC will do its job and then won't need money after five years because it'll be self-sustaining, which would be unique because there's no other organization anywhere in the world <laughs> that is. In any case, let me. Uh, but I think these are really important points. I. In a, in a sense, I wish we had been able to keep the senators to ask them what they can, can do about this, but we seem to be asking them to do a lot these days. Uh, Taffy, what you, what's your view on the environmental? Um, well, I think that my colleagues here have stated it very well. The environmental concerns are important. They take a long time to resolve. We don't have a long time to resolve this. Um, this whole notion of sustainability whether it's environmental sustainability or economic sustainability, very, very critical. And um, as you mentioned, most programs, a five-year program for investments that are this size, has, you know, it doesn't really compute. So we need to think about the long-term building a business model that works to keep these organizations operational. And you look at other programs, whether it's, uh, say, the manufacturing institutes, most of those institutes were set up initially for five to seven years, and I think they've all been refunded over, over time. So we need to understand that. And there's another point that really hasn't been raised, which is the interagency cooperation. It's really important. I think um, Allison spoke earlier about the um, ME Commons, Microelectronics Commons program, working closely with the NSTC and so on. But, that's, that's very important, but all of these programs, whether it's NSF, DOD, um, Department of Commerce, NASA, 
all of these programs need to have connections so that technology that is created through the R&D process can move into the move out of the lab into the fab into the manufacturing into advanced packaging in a coherent manner and and this requires a whole of government approach that we we haven't really talked about to much degree yet well you know there's some discussion on making those connections uh, in the U.S., we have a tendency to think that venture capital will always solve that. And uh, at least some of the work that you know we did at the academies, uh, one of the problems with venture capital, it's not in front of the valley of death, it's after the valley of death. Um, and uh, it, they kind of collect the survivors, if I could use the term. Um, but we do need to have bridging mechanisms. Um, and uh, we have some existing programs. That, that might do that. Um, like the SBIRs, if they're taking on a more muscular approach to fund prototyping and so on. But the, um, uh, there's this iceberg of the, um, of the NEPA out there. Um, there's another um, looming iceberg, I'm afraid, and you mentioned, uh, Taffy, that you both did, the talent uh, issues. And um, I understand you're cooperating up in Syracuse already with setting up um, programs at the community college level and at the university level um, uh, that should help. Can you talk about those a little bit? Is that? Yeah, sure. I, I think that that was, um, people ask us all the time about, are we concerned about workforce? Are we, and, and of course we are. Uh, we're very focused on it. Uh, we're being very intentional about it. Uh, we, uh, we created a uh, very robust program with the state of New York as part of our, the incentives for our green ships and, uh, program with them that included a very significant investment from, from Micron, from the state, and then from partners in the state. Uh, we just announced uh, the, the panel that we're going to be working with and the, the framework for it last week on, on community engagement. And part of that is a, a $250 million investment from Micron in uh, community engagement. And part of that, will, and the state's putting in another $100 million, and then we're raising another $150 million, so it's a $500 million fund. Part of that is going towards workforce development. That's not the, the exclusive amount of our investment in workforce development. We're also building a clean room at the uh, Onondaga Community College, which is very close to our site in, uh, in Clay, New York, and Onondaga County. And we're, we're doing a lot with the Collar Counties and uh, the Northeast Corridor of, of University Partnerships. We've, we've been in New York City. We've been talking to the downstate universities about partnerships. But, but the, as I mentioned, the appeal of New York, uh, one of the, the big appeals of New York was this, this amazing uh, educational system end-to-end -end, um, from the training facilities and the workforce development facilities, the amount of, of resources that the state <coughs> and local governments already invest in that, all the way up through, you know, the, the Cornells and the RPIs and the Syracuse universities. Then this, this phenomenal veteran and military population, um, huge facility at Syracuse University, um, that, that invests in veteran and military families transitioning into the workforce, more DOD money going into that facility than anywhere else in the country uh, that's not an existing DOD facility. Uh, so the, the workforce part for us there, there's almost so much we can do, we have to prioritize what makes the most sense. I think you know, we, we, probably, um, it, we probably will need to figure out where the most return on investment will come from and we'll, we'll obviously need to take people out of Syracuse area and train them at some of our other facilities and, and be able to get them ready to hit the ground running when we, do, when we are ready to, to actually start the manufacturing. But we, are, we, do, we do think coming in ahead of the fab producing wafers and the fab being up and running will help us by, by building that, that talent pipeline early. Well, that sounds very, very promising. <clears throat> the, uh some of the work we, we did in regional renaissance on the nano cluster in, in, in the Albany area. Of, one of the great advantages they had was the pre-existing university structure. And, uh, it's actually possibly a lesson to some other states who feel more neglected is that 
actually investing in universities uh, can pay off over time. The, uh, uh, and the ability of the uh, differentiator for New York, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, their ability to provide significant funds, and Arizona shares that, I believe. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, look, Arizona is a great example, right, mm -hmm. where we've actually built the ecosystem and we built the job training programs. And to your point, it starts with the universities, but it's all the way down to the community colleges and the high schools. And this really has to be a joint partnership at every level. Um, you know, as an example, we've done $150 million. We're putting $100 million in. NSF is putting in $50 million uh, to do a partnership in the Midwest and Ohio. We've already started giving out, we've already given out 17 grants to education consortiums in Ohio to start building that uh, talent pipeline. So it is doable. And, you know, the thing that's exciting about it, and it, it's funny, when we did the opening, uh, our CEO made this point, which is all these, you know, grandmothers who watch their kids move off, or their grandkids move off to the coast because that's where they're finding the jobs. This is going to help these areas, whether it's the Midwest, you know, so we're drawing in Ohio, we're also drawing off Michigan, we're dropping, a, you know, Purdue in Indiana, you know, so there's a whole benefit to the region that this is doable. I know, you know, there have been people who have questioned uh, whether the American workforce exists to do this, but, you know, look, all we have to do is point to what we already do in Oregon and, and uh, Arizona, and I would be happy to take somebody for a tour to see how this can work and that the models are out there. You know, and Courtney made one other really good point, which is, um, you know, the veterans. I and mean, one of the reasons we chose Ohio is because Wright Patman Air Force Base mm -hmm. is nearby, and both the veterans leaving service, but it's also a logistics hub. And, you know, in our fabs, we have found that uh, veterans are actually among the best people to work in fabs, because what you do in the military is you follow process, right? Well, what's a fab? You're just following a process and you're doing it. Uh, so the workforce is out there. It just takes these partnerships and some money to help develop them, but it is very doable and it's, it's challenging. You know, and I, I, you've also mentioned uh, the construction workers as well. And I think we're all gonna face uh, the challenge of making sure, you know, Courtney was given the statistics, but you know, we, it'll take us about, we need about 6,000 skilled tradesmen to do this site in Ohio. And we did work with the state of Ohio uh, to try to make sure that the folks are available, but as other building goes on, this is gonna create shortages and challenges in competition. We're already seeing this in Arizona, uh, you know, as we're building in TSMC's building, a competition for, right. uh, for you know, skilled labor. Are you, uh, are the local authorities helping you on that kind of, because we- Yeah, they, they've been great. Now, I, I should have uh, given a shout out to our Ohio partners, um, you know, with, with who we've been working for. Uh, when, when, as Courtney talked about New York, Ohio's been great. Like Governor DeWine and his team are so focused. They're so good at this. But you can't do it without it, right? I mean, Arizona, the reason we've been successful in Arizona is because with the partnership with the state and with Maricopa County. You know, the job training program we have at Maricopa County Community College is, uh, you know, is a great example, but it's like a, it's the gold standard for how these works. Same thing in Oregon. We could not do it without these partnerships, and you, you can't be successful without you know, partnering with the state and local governments and really uh, being successful. It's just now what's new is this chip sack piece to really bring in the money to fill the cost of it. Well, to galvanize it, which it seems, Absolutely. It's, it seems to be doing. In fact, it seems quite incredible what it's... Uh, Hopefully we haven't been too successful that they run out of money too quickly. <laughs> well, isn't the... Uh, the advantage there, the investment tax code to back up. Further. It is, but it only goes up to 25%. And the challenge is if you've got a 40% cost gap, you've got to fill that other 15%. Because this is, you know, and these guys can talk about this is an incredibly cutthroat industry, right? Like, you know, every dollar of margin is money that you put back into R&D, into CapEx. Um, so, you know, a couple points of, of, of cost gap is actually substantial. And that's why commerce getting it right and helping to make sure that we fill that cost gap is so unbelievably important because if we don't, um, you know, then, then it's going to lead to challenges. And I think the real question here, and this is a question for policymakers, is do we want to manufacture semiconductors in the United States? Because if we do, we need a long-term sustained strategy, not just, a, you know, not just what's the, um, you know, time horizon of the CBO scores, right? Like we can't be dictated by what the CBO scoring schedule is, there's got to be a sustained long-term commitment. Well, I think I think that's a really important message. Pardon? With respect to the sustainability and with respect to um, cost gaps and so on, 
I'd like to just point out the importance of international collaboration um, in terms of technology development too, because we don't, in the United States today, we do not have technology leadership in some of the areas that are so critical, for instance, in advanced lithography. And we need to have uh, international participation in our activities if we want to have a full ecosystem here in the United States. So this, the role, and like it or not, no one company can do it all anymore in this, in this industry. It's so complex and there's so many areas of expertise required that we all need to work together to bring the resources, the intellectual capital, the process knowledge. It's not just the creation. The creation is really, really important. The R&D piece is really important. We, we have to build the future, but we have to also take advantage of the process knowledge that we have in existing capabilities today if we want to move forward. And I think that's uh, something that we haven't underscored sufficiently well. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good point. I, and, you know, Mike Run and, and some of our peers kind of trade back and forth on, on technology leadership and, and memory, but um, Micron has, is, is one of the leading companies in the world on patents. We have almost 52,000 patents, and many, many of those are, are in process manufacturing. And that, those, those process manufacturing patents, those technologies, those things that we, that we do, do not just transfer to, to semiconductor manufacturing, they transfer across all of manufacturing, advanced mm -hmm. manufacturing in different industries. And if the U.S. wants to, to, be, to be doing smart manufacturing and to be you know, bringing some of that back over time in, across different industries and creating jobs, doing this differently going forward, this is the kind of thing we have to be doing here. And you know, we've been doing R&D here, but not manufacturing. And those are the kinds of things that you know, could be really, really important for economic growth and job creation, skills growth, the things that, that we should you know, be looking to do in the United States. One of the things I'd like to underscore that Courtney just mentioned has to do with this whole notion of intellectual property protection and patents. IBM has a huge patent portfolio. We've been the patent leader for 29 years in a row in the United States. As we look at what is the kind of, uh, what is the framework for IP that works for the variety of organizations that are in the ecosystem, I think we need to look and if this possible, to create some sort of an IP model contract. And SRC, and Todd's going to talk about this later, is, you know, is a leader in bringing together semiconductor organizations uh, in a patent kind of a, with patents and a portfolio management system that works. We need to make sure we can create a portfolio management system that works for the variety of organizations, small, medium sized large, universities, whatever, in the country, and make it accessible and workable for everybody. I think it's a very important point. But you also mentioned uh, drawing on international resources and uh, that not everything is here. Well, right. One of the things that's not here is we could train in the community colleges, but that's not going to give you the high-end engineers you want. Uh, what do you think of the prospects, and this is an easy assignment, just to get a carve out on national security grounds to uh, import um, Engineers. For immigration for high skilled immigrants. I mean, look, I think speaking for all of us, it is crazy that we as a country, that 80% of our computer science uh, graduate students are foreign born and that we don't staple a green card and roll out the red carpet well, for sorry. every one of them. I mean, it's just our, our immigration policy is remarkably short sighted if it doesn't relate to how we are competitive. And to your point, it is a national security issue. Um, unfortunately, there seems to be a stalemate that we can't. Uh, get this fixed because, you know, and I think all of our companies have spent a huge amount of time and effort and money trying to improve the system because it, it just is mind-boggling that the United States wants to be globally competitive and that we're not doing more to make sure that we're attracting the best talent in the world uh, who, frankly, want to be here. They want to live here. They want to study here. They want to stay here. And we don't roll out the red carpet in the way that we should. Oh, well, we do attract them and we do train them and then we send them to work for the opposition. And... Uh, I think you're right, that's a little bit short-sighted. But the question is, uh, the hard question is, and I'd like your professional views, can we wrap this enough in the flag uh, on national security grounds to be able to get, and I mentioned a carve-out because we're not gonna fix the whole system, that's too politically convenient for some. So how can we do that? And uh, do you think there's any possibility of traction there? 
or should I go get a drink? I, I gave up predicting Congress years ago, so I don't ask. That was probably the wrong one. Well, that does seem to be um, one path forward. You're also making what is encouraging these private investments in the education. I mean, $250 million is not trivial. In it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, microns be commended, and you seem to be doing similar. And of course, CNSC has for years um, been, an, been an active source. What else do you see um, in, your, in your list of risks and obstacles? We've got NEPA, we're uh, running out of people and we'll run out of the CHIPS Act. Uh, aside from that, things look fairly, fairly <laughs> cheery. Are you asking all of us? Yes, all of them. <laughs> yeah. Look, I think the fact of the matter is the time has come and, you know, the time is now and the word is go. We have to figure these things out. There are lots of problems, and let's just turn problems into opportunities and get it done. Because we, it's important for our companies, it's more important for our country, and it's important for our, our kids and our grandkids, for ourselves as well. But now is the time for this once in a generation opportunity, and we just gotta put pedal to the metal and make it go. Yeah. Well, we certainly have a foundation. That's actually a, perhaps a very good conclusion for the for the presentation. Any of you have a last comment? No, I was, like I was just going to say to add on to your question. I mean, look, one, one of the things when I, when I worked for, uh, one of the commerce secretaries I worked for, his slogan was build it here and sell it everywhere. And we do need policies that help to open markets and to frankly keep, um, you know, keep the flow of commerce, you know, and, and Taffy and, uh, and Courtney both hit on this, but these are global industries, right? We're mm -hmm. dealing with suppliers and we're also dealing with markets around the world. And obviously there are very legitimate national security concerns that the U.S. government has to uh, engage in. But then the flip side to that is let's make sure that we're optimizing and maximizing the ability to sell into markets around the world if there aren't national security concerns. Because, um, you know, I think all of our companies spend a huge amount of time on geopolitical issues because it just creates a, a level of uncertainty and challenges, um, you know, and, and so uh, ha recognizing that we can't compromise on national security, but that we need to maximize every other opportunity uh, to make sure that U.S. companies are able to be successful in markets around the world. That's, that's very well said, and uh, if I heard you correctly, we need to have policies to protect our national security, uh, but at the same time, you're there's the risk that we uh, we cripple uh, some of our our own companies, notably the equipment suppliers who have had a significant uh, reduction. Ninety five percent of the world's consumers are outside the United States, right. so we can't uh, we got to remember that. Right. Well, those are <clears throat> one of the things it seems we need to get better at are some difficult trade offs, um, which for the most part we don't seem to want want to make. Uh, so perhaps encouraging a little dialogue on these issues and. Understanding at Taffy's point, the the stakes are, are very real, and uh, the Chips Act is a departure from business as usual. Um, although the academic part of me can't leave the idea that we we don't have industrial policies. I don't know whether you've heard about the NIH, <laughs> but you know the <clears throat> odd uh, forty or fifty billion a year uh, devoted to particular industry has uh, has transformed where we were in the world. Uh, in the 1980s, Europe led us in drug production. Uh, they no longer, they no longer do uh, in drug production, patents, whatever. Um, but it's a. Uh, I think that underscores that if we get ourselves together and get the, it, it's it seems to be a little strange to say it, uh, but the 52 billion is both significant and not enough, and uh, the idea will be how do we continue this. A last question, what would you prefer, uh, just maybe it's too much of a policy wonk, but uh, doesn't the investment tax credit have some advantages over the direct grants, um, at least, not least politically, which is not irrelevant. It's always hard to explain why prosperous companies, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders never seems to quite understand why it is. <laughs> Uh, but, it, but it's a real point. I mean, the, the investment tax credit is sort of an automatic matching. You know, you make the investment, the government will help you. 
Yeah. Um, no, look, there is a huge benefit to it. And if Congress said tomorrow we're not going to do another round of grants, but we're going to turn, we're going to make the investment tax credit forty percent, I don't think any of the companies up here would change. I mean, the react for us, it's how do you fill the cost gap? And to your point, having something is elastic rather than you know, for example, the Chips Act limits to three billion per project, which sounded like a lot when they were passing the Chips Act. Now, actually, is the cost <laughs> gone up? you know, not nearly as much. And so the good news is commerce is focused on, you know, taking them together and figuring out how to fill the cost gap. But your point is, you know, if I were recommending to policymakers of the future, I, I think that's a pretty thoughtful idea. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think Bruce's point is, is right on the, that he made earlier about the $52 billion is going to be uh, gone very quickly. And, uh, and it requires commerce to pick winners and losers on some level. And, uh, that, that is what makes this a you know, politically challenging program. And the ITC, the investment tax credit, doesn't have to do that. So I think that's, that's why it's, um, it, it's, it's preferable for, for everybody if that was the, you know, if that was the answer. It, for Micron, we needed both. The 25% doesn't cover that, that, tax, or that cost gap. And, and uh, the US is going to have to figure out how to remain competitive going forward if they want to, to be able to, to play a role in this and like Bruce said they have to decide whether they want to play a role in this and, and have advanced semiconductor manufacturing here in the US and I think we all know that there are good reasons to have a part of this ecosystem here you know we can't do it all we have to have our our global allies and our partners involved and uh, but I think there there is there are good wrap yourself in the flag national security reasons that the US needs to play a significant role in this that makes that makes perfect sense. It just will be perhaps a little challenging. But I think a key message that you raised is that our 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 colleagues and competitors have, have really upped their game. I mean, TSMC is I think spending 40 billion next year, and the Chips Act is 52 billion. So you know, and then the Koreans I think are are north of 400 billion over the next five years, and. Um, It'll be interesting to whether we're going to have the French experience where they tried to, they thought state support would keep them in the game and found out they couldn't afford it. Uh, we can afford it, arguably, but the question, your last point, I think, is do we want to stay in this game or not? Uh, for the reasons you all know, I fervently hope that we do. Um, but we do need to, uh, we do need to publicize it. I think it's very hard for people on the Hill, uh, not to mention the general public, to understand the scale of these investments. I mean, you know, 40 billion here, 40 billion there, 80 billion there, it's, uh, it's hard, I, I think, genuinely hard for them to grasp at what level this, is, this competition is taking place. So I think uh, we've identified all the intractable problems. and. Uh, Perhaps we can break and have a lunch and perhaps develop a path forward. Thank you very much. <laughs>